Valley Unified School District Board meeting for Wednesday, March 11th, 2020. Um, I will now go out to agenda item 1.2, public comments on closed session agenda. Are there any public comments to closed session items? Yes, we have um, five public speakers. So I'll, I'll call the first three, if you can line up. So is it Tase Higuchi? Tase Higuchi, my apologies. Abel Mejia? And Carlos Patino. were positive. I have them from year two. I was unable to get a hold of my evaluations from year one. I'm equity focused. It can be easy to sacrifice equity in pursuit of higher test scores. I have made equity a focus of my practice. I have given only four referrals all year. I believe in connection over correction and I can handle my own discipline. Two, I specifically requested to be part of the special ed inclusion co-teaching team. I, deliberately taking in um, a larger caseload of students with higher needs. Uh, my D and F rates are the lowest in the Math 1 team as referenced by the letter of recommendation from my department chair. I do everything to ensure that Math 1 will not be the reason that one of my students does not graduate from Watsonville High School. I advocate for my students and for my colleagues. I brought an email chain where I'm advocating for the well-being of my students. I do speak up when I think something is wrong or detrimental, even if it angers someone in power. Right now, there are five teachers that will no longer be here next year. Two have submitted their resignations and accepted offers at other schools. One is retiring. One lost his internship credential. He was not fully qualified halfway through the year and had to vacate the position. Um, the last, I think I already said, was retiring, and then the last one is me. There will be five positions next year that need to be filled. Um, the district struggles, struggles every single year to staff math classrooms. This past year, there were two positions that needed to be filled. You could not fill one of them, one out of two positions with a credentialed math teacher. It is a choice between me and an empty classroom. It is a choice between me and a series of long-term subs or even short-term subs. I have multiple letters of recommendation. I have multiple letters of recommendation, which I can provide to you. Thank you for your time. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Carlos Patino from Watson High School. Uh, I'm a class of 2000 Watson High School graduate. Uh, I got my credential and master's and came back and have been teaching at Watson High School for 15 years. Um, I have lost track of how many teachers come and go. Uh, I've lost track how administration uh, and the district just lets a long-term sub be in classrooms and no, no significant learning is getting done in those classrooms. Um, I was teaching today two sophomores and they don't know what a radius or a diameter is. You know, that's a fourth or fifth grade standard, somewhere around there. And you know what they tell me? We had a long-term sub. And I said, I'm sorry, guys. I want to do the best that I can to raise the level of your education. When we cannot keep fully credentialed teachers at our high school, we're giving them a subpar education. It's not fair to them. All right, we're going to say this, that, and the other. We can, we can make a difference. We could keep a teacher today that's fully credentialed, that's capable. That's an asset to our department. I love every time Tace has to say something in our department because like, hmm, I didn't see it that way, or that's a good point. We're, we're gonna lose a valuable asset. Like Tace said, there's five people in our department leaving. How many long-term subs are we gonna be okay with keeping in the math department? My classes will be full. 
my tutorials will be full. I'm okay with that. But I'm only one person. I've been here 15 years. And if we're gonna give up on the young teachers that wanna be here, how are we gonna keep the teachers, how are we gonna get anybody to be here? We're, we're losing two teachers and they're getting paid more in another district and they're not looking back twice. It's been a rough year. I've gone to school, I didn't even know what I was teaching some days because our schedule is so bad. I don't blame the new teachers for leaving. <clears throat> Hi, Abel Mejia, um, graduate of Watson High School, class of 88. Been at Watson High since 2001 and seen a revolving door of unqualified teachers coming to our school and some getting tenure. And then I've seen highly qualified, excellent teachers not get reelected to come back and get their tenure. Tace happens to be one of those that would be a shame if we were to lose her. My students are very honest, and they'll tell me when they know of a bad teacher, a bad sub. They just feel comfortable telling me things because we share that experience of I'm a wildcat. They're wildcats. They want what's best for our school. I want what's best for our school. And taste is one of those things that we need in our school. She may say things that are unpopular, but that's okay. That's what a democracy is about. We have to have a diversity of opinion, a diversity of perspective, if we're going to hold on to this thing called success. We need her, and I hope that you support her as well. Thank you. Next we have uh, Viviana uh, Gonzalez and Pablo Berg. So my name is um, Viviana Gonzalez. I am. I've been teaching at Watsonville High School. This is on my going to my going on my 16th year. Um, I also graduated from Watsonville High School. I am not someone who usually comes to the front of the board and speak. If I am here, it's because I highly believe in tastes and. Um, I am impressed. As she mentioned that um, last year our NWA scores went up higher than any other year. And I'm, if, if you guys have seen the NWA scores, you're familiar. You know that math went up higher than. Um, any other subject, and I on it, she is part of the Math One group. I honestly think that a huge part of it was um, her contribution. I'm con I have first period prep, and she had first period prep, and I'm constantly seeing her come up with these amazing lessons. I currently teach math too, and um, I've I have, I'm not interested right now in teaching math one, but I would love to work with her. And there's there's also another colleague there that's also amazing because of their um, hands-on collaborative lessons that I think are amazing. Um, I also think she's amazing at working with at-risk students. At, since the beginning of the year, I mean, sometimes we just say hi, bye, because we're not teaching the same course. But since the, our conversa most of our conversations have, her, have been with her coming into my classroom and saying, how is such and such as Edwin doing? Um, totally at-risk student. And I am just impressed how she's able to connect. Yes, she's able to connect with students who are not at risk, but especially her strength, I think, is to be able to connect with our at risk students. Um, like I am not 99, if not 100% sure that the student, the students that she's always checking, that she's constantly checking in um, to ask about in my classroom would not be where they're at if it wasn't for her and her belief in in them. Um, I know, and I asked her, like, how did you do it? How did you get them involved? She said she would have them in, a, I don't know how she got them into after school tutorial, but was getting, she would stay after school to help them. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pablo Barrett, class of 84 from Watsonville High School. Um, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Um, a second year teacher with good evals not being asked back. And it, it really is questioned that the rest of us, well, what if we didn't have our tenure? What if we were not, if we are second year teachers and we happen to maybe say something that made management uncomfortable? And the response is, well, we'll get somebody else to replace them. There is nobody else to replace them. We are losing a first year teacher. She's getting five years of credit at the school that she's going to because they cannot find a qualified, certificated mathematics teacher at that school. First year, she's getting five years credit. It's unheard of because they want to make sure that they retain her. 
These, these folks have, have, have said it, and I have worked personally with TASE. Last year I was on with the Math 1 team. They came over to my house so we could plan and study and get ready for the Math 1. It was their first year. I'd never seen so much excitement, so much adeptness at technology. Quite frankly, I couldn't keep up. <laughs> I was really impressed. She and Tish, who was her roommate, who wrote you a letter about her, knows her more intimately than any of us, says it all, really. I mean... I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the, the, the logic is. Maybe, again, this is just over my pay grade, right? But there's an ancient saying, thousands of years old, iron sharpens iron. And we've learned that in our department that, you know, we might not have the same opinion, but we know how to work together. And it seems short-sighted that if, if you're the person who's overseeing these folks and you can't figure out a way to maybe find one little thing to fix instead of just throwing the baby out with the bath bathwater, that's... That's curious at best. I think maybe not just us being evaluated, but maybe management being evaluated should be taken more seriously. Thank you for your time. We appreciate your looking into this uh, uh, a second time. Thank you very much. Is that it? No more problems. Next up, when we go into closed session, we will we'll talk about agenda item 2.1, which is certificated public employee appointment employment Government Code Section 54957, 2.2, Classified Public Employee Appointment. Appointment Appointment, govern, Government Code Section 54957, 2.3, Negotiations Update, 2.4, Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release Leaves, 2.5, Resolution Number 19-20-32, Notice of Non-Re-Election of Certain Probationary Certificate Employees. Agenda item 2.6, approved settlement for Keenan claim number 553165, 2.7, anticipated litigation and one case. Thank you very much. Maria, I'm, I'm just going to get started. Most of us are here. So. Um, thank you, everybody. Today is Wednesday, March 11th, 2020. Welcome to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board Meeting. Um, for agenda item 3.1, I will ask Karen Osmondson if she'd like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome to our Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board Meeting. Just to let you know, we have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Magdalena Maciel, who's standing there uh, at the back of the room. So next off, we will start off with uh, agenda item 3.3, Dr. Rodriguez, our superintendent. So usually I do my comments in English and Spanish. I'll be only doing them in English today because of the length of them. So um, people that need it in Spanish will be hearing it from Magdalena. So our students' health and safety is paramount for us and our community and educational partners. This afternoon, we received notification that a person at Rio del Mar Elementary has tested positive for coronavirus. The Santa Cruz County Public Health Department confirmed that a person at Rio del Mar was placed on quarantine because of testing positive to COVID-19. They are recommending school dismissal for 14 days after the date of last exposure. The individual has not been on the site since Friday, February 28, 2020. After careful consideration and in light of the new information, effective immediately, the district will dismiss Rio del Mar Elementary School until Monday, March 16, 2020. Please note that to date, no other individual has tested positive to COVID-19. At this time, we ask 
others to make the parents to make arrangements for their students for Thursday, March 12th and Friday, March 13th. As classes will be canceled and any school related activities will be canceled. During this time, the site will be deep cleaned to ensure the health and safety of students and staff. I did want to note that our staff is the one who developed the countywide process um, for the cleaning. So I'm proud of our staff for doing that. During this time, um, they will receive another notification if the school must remain closed after the noted date. This complex decision includes, included close collaboration and coordination with our County Office of Education, the Board of Trustees, and the Santa Cruz County Public Health Department. We will continue to work closely with multiple community partners to coordinate and adjust planned activities as needed. And then if there are any questions, they are to um, contact our Public Information Officer, Alicia Jimenez, as she has constant contact with me. Um, so I want um, people to know that we are going to continue to follow the health, the health official. She is the only one who can actually close down a school. And so we will continue to follow um, that lead. And so if you can put up the other document for me. Okay, so I want to address um, I want to address something that has been out there. I believe that many of you will not wind up staying for um, the for the budget presentation. So I wanted to go over some information. So many of you, hopefully, you saw the one pager that spoke to the benefits. Um, what I want you to see is um, yes. Um, when it comes to teacher salary, our, only 30.57% of our budget is for teachers. Um, and the state average is higher. So the state average is 35.42. Um, if you're wondering where we received this from, we took it from the CDE website. So you're more than happy to go to that website. That's exactly where we got it from. Um, and so it's based on the SACS unaudited actuals. Um, found on the CDE website. You'll see that for classified salary, we're a little, our percentage of our budget is a little higher than normal, but we are about out, at par. Um, there is a question of where's the other 8%, right? So there is um, other school districts have um, higher pay, many of them not higher take home pay, but they have higher pay. And so this is where our priority is at this moment. So when you look at what percentage of our budget is towards benefits, it's 16.93% is towards budget, um, is towards benefits, where the average in the state of California is 8.35. Um, and then management, you will see the av our, av our percentage is 5.27, and the average is 6%. So we're about at par at everything, um, not teacher salary, but at the other two, except for benefits. So I wanted to bring that to light because if you stay for our budget um, presentation, you will see this information, but I wanted to make sure that you had it while you were here. Thank you very much. Next up, agenda item 3.4, uh, governing board comments and reports to the standing committees. Um, I would like to ask the trustees if they can pass along their time to keep the board meeting moving. So I'd like to start off with Ms. Trustee Acosta. If you, if you could, yeah. I'll waive my time. I'll do the same. Oh, thank you. I will pass as well. I'll, I'll pass. All right. Next up we have Okay, so do we have Watsonville, the representative? Good evening. Just a reminder, my name is Omar Casillas. I'm a senior at Watsonville High. So I want to start off this meeting by uh, reminding everyone that we had LPAC testing February 24th to 25th. Oh, sorry. Are we good? 
All right. We had uh, testing, LPAC testing, uh, February 24th to 25th. They were very quiet days and like people were focused, which is good because hopefully we can reflect our students' effort and all their effort in school and our testing and see how they have grown as students and as individuals. Another thing was we had a Royal Hearts Week, which last time I presented, uh, we were going halfway through it. But uh, because of construction, our cafeteria, our like, dance had to be moved to the vets hall right across the street from us. So we were kind of like iffy about it because we didn't know how it was going to go. But it was a great success. We had like around the S. I think we had a little more turnout than we usually do like in our gym ourselves. So it was very good. And then the dress out days were very fun. We had uh, a theme this year of a punny Valentine. So every day had a, like a pun attached to it. So like you color my world was like like a stoplight day, which is like red if you're taken, pink if it's complicated, white if you're single. And like all all the rest of the days had like similar or like uh, had a plan that was atta similarly attached to a, like a dress out day. And then events. We had donkey basketball on February 21st put up by FFA and I wasn't very sure of this, but I found out that it's just what it sounds, it's people playing basketball on a donkey. <laughs> and it's, I don't know. I, I didn't get to go, but I hear that it's very fun and it was very enjoyed. And maybe one day in the future, I will get to play, uh, see someone play basketball on a donkey. And from what I heard is that like, you can't throw the ball if you're not on the donkey. So like if you drop the ball, you have to get off the donkey and then back on the donkey just to throw the ball. <laughs> so we can imagine how like tedious that is. We also had our uh, Pause for Talent on the 28th, put on by Amata Club. It's a fundraiser uh, for them, and it, it's a, a, something that students love a lot. It's like the, everyone get, like people get to perform and like show their talents that they might not get to like you know just walk around and like just walk into their classroom and sing like a, three songs, but it, they get to hear. So that's very fun. And then our soccer team, as I mentioned last time, they were doing very good in their season. In their season, and they actually went to CCS semifinals and the NorCal tournament. They're like one of our strongest team and uh, like this year we have worked harder on getting them recognition and like their hard work and efforts. So it was very nice to see them succeed and go on to higher level competitions. Following, I would like to thank Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Reed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Reed actually went to Watson High and talked to our leadership class about any questions or concerns we had about our campus. and. While they were only there with us for about 30 to minutes to an hour, it was such an impactful moment because it's time you get to see like people that are like working for the district and get to make these top decisions, like actually take in student input, which I think is a very vital thing to make our district run very uh, smoothly. It was very appreciated. Thank you personally uh, for going uh, for going there. A lot of the students enjoyed like getting the attention, and it wasn't like just getting attention. It's just like knowing that they're being heard by the district and that our concerns feel more valid rather than just us going to our like teachers or our admin and just like complaining about something. It was very, we greatly appreciated that they spent some of their time on us. And then following, we would have to, we have, we want to address some issues and some questions about bathrooms. This is Mady Manso. She's also a senior at Watson High. She has taken a very strong initiative and the issues regarding our bathrooms, and she uh, she actually has some questions for the board, and I I uh, we invited her to come and speak because she is very passionate about this issue, and I'll just let her speak. Thank you. Um, my name is Miri Monzo, like he said. Um, a, a lot of students and I had some concerns because of the um, viruses going around, not just the coronavirus, but influenza. Um, as of yesterday, we only had one working soap dispenser in the entire school for boys' restrooms. So I was wondering what the district and administration was doing to kind of fix that issue and to look more into it. Um, we also have some mold growing inside our soap dispensers, which is also very worrisome because we have a lot of posters up on our school telling us to wash our hands and be very sanitary, but we don't have these facilities available to us in order for us to be clean and sanitary around other students. In reference to the moldy soap dispensers, I have emailed some pictures that Mady herself, she went around and like took pictures of all like the soap dispensers and like the issues that we had. And uh, I emailed it to like all the board members if you could see it and like please take that into consideration. Finally, thank you for listening to us. It was a pleasure to be up here again. Uh, if you have any questions, that's my email. Please like don't hesitate to contact me. Thank, thank you. you.
So next up, agenda item 3.6, Swansville School Waste Reduction Recognition Report by our Mayor, Rebecca Garcia. I am so excited to be here before you uh, this evening to acknowledge the strong partnership that has developed between the Pajaral Unified School District and the city. And I want to thank for many of you who are trustees who have come to our city council meetings and shared your thoughts and rec uh, recognition. But I'm just as excited because I, with some of our staff, are going to be presenting certificates uh, to uh, some uh, some students and others who have really helped in our partnership with you in terms of our recycling program. And so at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Ilda and, and Tammy if they come up with me because we're going to present uh, certificates. And in addition to that, uh, Tammy and Ilda will be giving you a formal uh, presentation. So I'd like to begin. And I'm going to lean over because I, uh, I want to first acknowledge... Uh, some very uh, motivated young people. If I can have Linda Bravo, yeah. Andres, Andres Villafaña, uh, Robert Baker, Ismael Bravo, Bernie Mora, if you will come out. These are the uh, Pajaro Valley High Green Grizzlies. <laughs> And I just like to say, uh, read what the certificate says. It says, the Pajaro Valley High Green Grizzlies, uh, we recognize you and appreciate you for your committed support of your Pajaro Valley Unified School District Recycling Program. This is the City of Watsonville Green Schools. Okay. okay. Each what? Each one of you will get a certificate because we didn't have all your names yet, so we'll give you each a, a certificate. We didn't know who was going to show up. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, if H.A. Uh, High School Green Team can come up. Come over here, come over here, come over here, over here, over here, over here. Over here. Over here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, if we can have uh, Laura Rodriguez. Here. Ah. <laughs> okay. Brian Wallace. <laughs> Kevin Roth. Thank you. Carmen Merino. And Kathy Miller. Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez, can we get a picture with the mayor and everybody that she's presented an award for? That would be. Okay, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And if you want to wait just a minute, we do have some other awards. I wanted to recognize, um, thank you, Mayor Garcia, and um, Maybe you could stay. Oh, yes. <laughs> Smile. Um, maybe, Mark, Mayor Garcia, if you want to stay up front. We have our top awards. These are our true eco heroes that really work hard every single day to make sure that these waste reduction programs really tick at the schools. Yesenia Jimenez is the perfect example. She started the Green Grizzly program at PB, and she works really hard to get the students involved in creative ways. Um, Nadia was recognized with the H.A. Hyde Green Team, and Nadia won't let one single milk carton go in the trash or one single food scrap. 
go in the trash. So it's, she really works hard at this uh, every day. Uh, Angelica Carrasco is here. And is Freddie here? Freddie is not here. But at, at Ann Soldo, I walk in, and Angelica is leading the students and telling them what the system is. And that makes a big difference. When students grow up and they know how to reduce waste, they, it's great. They can all participate. So thank you, Angelica. Thank you, teammate Freddie. Uh, Jeff Cortez at Lynn Scott has been recycling and composting for over 20 years, hey. as long as anybody's known him. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Arnold Wilson and Stefan Lovell at Starlight. <laughs> I had to take pictures of the Starlight system and show other school districts because their system is really ideal and it, it just, it works like magic and they really reduce waste. So all the awardees, if you could come up front and get a picture with our whole group with the mayor and Superintendent Rodriguez and the board. Where should we join you? I'm right here. In the right there? Okay. Yeah. I can hear myself. I can hear myself. All right. Take one with my Hello. It's me. Hello. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. This is for you, Tammy. <laughs> So we're going to make a very brief presentation about our PVUSD and City Waste Reduction Partnership so you can learn a little more about it. So my name is Tammy Stolzenthaler. I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator with the City. I'm Hilda Peralta. I'm with the Solid Waste Division for the City of Watsonville. So thank you for celebrating our success with this wonderful program. You can see that many staff and students and administrators have joined together to create this model waste reduction program. So tonight we'll, we'll share with you some of the, the details of this successful program. Uh, our program here in Watsonville has become a model for other agency programs throughout the Monterey Bay area. All right. In 2016, it became a mandate to recycle and process food scraps. And this is part of the state's wider vision to reduce our reliance on landfills and to also reduce greenhouse gases. So Watsonville has been really working hard to develop this program here locally. We currently have the infrastructure and a full route designated to collecting food scraps. Uh, the material that you see at the end is what it looks like when we recycle food scraps. We currently work with over 50 businesses, excuse me, that, um, that are currently participating in the program. 50, yeah. 50, yeah. 
And so it's a range of businesses. We have uh, markets, local restaurants, and it's important that we're working with schools now because food is really a valuable resource that we're able to recycle and process. We have the technology through our partners at Monterey Regional to process food scraps, to extract the, the biogas that food has and use that as renewable energy. And whatever is left, we use it as compost that goes to local farms. This is really making us look at food a little bit in a different way because food is no longer going to the landfill. We are now able to process and collect that and recycle it. So food is a resource and we started working with the school district because of the volume of waste produced and the opportunities we wanted uh, to work with uh, local schools to make improvements. So Tammy's gonna talk a little bit about the pilot that we launched. So in 2018, we partnered with PVUSD Food Service. We have Linda Liu here and Kevin Roth with operations and, of course, the, the finance office. And we, we kick-started our waste reduction partnerships. And the, the results have been really remarkable. We've trained over 165 staff in the new systems for, for garbage. We started food scrap collection at 14 schools inside of Watsonville. We've built food share and donation programs to keep a massive amount of food out of the trash. We added 10 bottle fillers. Uh, hundreds of students have been educated about being stewards of our environment and to be responsible. And we've built green teams of students that can be stewards at their school sites. So you can see the difference here. Before our first audit, this is what we found in most trash cans. And with a little bit of, of training and um, education, this is what happened very quickly. Food scraps in the food bin, recycling in, in the, the blue cart, and a lot more of this food can be donated. It's actually legal to donate food because of California's new, uh, what would you call it? Good new Samaritan. Good Samaritan laws. Um, and this is a very important way to keep a massive amount of excellent food out of, the, out of the trash. We have 14 schools with this system now, and we have model programs at Ansoldo, Starlight, Linscott, and H.A. Hyde that are pro providing great examples for other schools and what can be achieved if, if staff put some effort into it. So this is what it looks like over at, on the left, Starlight, and on the right at Ansoldo in separating the, the food that can be repurposed, recycled, or, or food scraps. The students really enjoy being on the green team. They, um, they want to be stewards, they want to help their community and their environment, and we want them to grow up being, being stewards. It's an important part of their, their education. Um, one thing that's very important is being clear about the new system, and Angelica and Mr. Lovell do a great job you know, announcing to the students and, and telling being clear with them about how, how to recycle more. Uh, for, there's still, we still have a long way to go. Uh, there's still a, a huge waste stream seeing that you serve 15,000 meals a day. So we, we, sh we could try harder to clarify what kind of food, what, what food exactly needs to be taken. We, um, it would be nice if students didn't have to take a milk if, if, that, if they aren't gonna drink it. We can implement uh, the Obama's traveling apple policy so students can take an apple and a grain with them to go. Um, increasing food donations or repurposing food. Um, that it, The Salvation Army wants this food to give to people of need. We're hoping maybe we can partner with PVUSD on getting more Food Corp and AmeriCorps volunteers. It really needs to be part of their duties to help reduce the, the waste stream and to um, purposely use food. Yeah, and now that we've Im implemented these, these diversion programs, we, w we look forward to working with district staff to really assessing the garbage level that you guys are producing and uh, hopefully reducing that so we can save the district some money on that. And then, yeah. Um, we found a Starlight and H.A. Hyde that we're reducing garbage by about 40%, so the, sa the money savings can follow with that and back in the operations budget. And we're willing to work, the city is willing to work with PVUSD on that. <laughs> 
We, all, we also want to include recycling and food scraps in job descriptions to really, and do more training on that. Uh, at secondary schools, we, we hope more schools can become like PV High. We want to have more teens involved in making a difference and not being embarrassed about recycling. Uh, the other thing, area of improvement is uh, where we can make more progress if, is we're noticing that a lot of packaging is actually being landfilled, so really exploring other solutions such as um, BPI packaging. So overall, congratulations on our amazing waste reduction partnership. Let's continue to make a difference for a positive future. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any public comments to this item? Any questions or comments from the board? All right, next up we'll go to... Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda. I have a second. Second. I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, agenda item 5.1, approval of March 11th, 2020 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. I'll second. All, right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Abstain. Thanks. Next off, uh, agenda item 6.1, public comment. And I just wanted to say, due to the World, Horth, World, World Health Organization declaring uh, uh, global pandemic, of COVID-19 with the CDC and our County of Santa Cruz and the City of Watsonville all declaring a state of emergency. I would like if we could keep our um, comments to one minute. Oh, wow. We're already here. How is that the image is sent. The email sent out by, on your behalf said two minutes, two minutes earlier. Didn't we Calling us. One minute, why? Well, I mean, technically, there's a lot of us here that, You know, last night, um, briefly, um, President Trustee Dodge Jr., three of us sitting governing board members attended the city council meeting, and they did a similar thing last night, reducing the t speaking time mm -hmm. in recognition of COVID-19. So I will move to support your decision to limit the time to one minute. Okay. All right. Well, I will now call for a vote. I don't have to call for a vote. Okay, well. No, 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 no. Okay, all right. Well, that's what I'm saying. So we'll just go ahead with the one minute. According to Ed Code, it doesn't need to go to a vote. So I know that a lot of you are here tonight. I appreciate you coming out amid the coronavirus. I know that you have a lot to say. I know you have a lot to say. I haven't talked for one minute. If you want to be rude, that is your prerogative. The board is here to do business, and we appreciate the teachers coming to make their comments. You have one minute to speak. So well, what I have is so we were allowing people to email in comments. So what I will do is I will alternate. So I'll, ha I'll call out three names, and then I'll read three of the emails, and we'll alternate in that fashion. So that's that's what we're doing. Well, you guys can come up and speak. We're not saying that you can't speak. Just Yeah, well, public, she's going to read off the names, and then everybody come and speak. I'm ready. So just as to be respectful, I think we should just allow whoever's present to speak first, and then we can read the emails, just to clarify. I thought that was the point, but... So the first three I have are Amy Lauta, Laura Azaro, and Lady Leon. 
before you speak, uh, yes. wipe down the space yeah. and then you have to let it dry for 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. And you have to let it air dry. And here's some hand sanitizer. Yeah. Here's some hand sanitizer. Actually, there I you go. It. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. I know we're all really emotional, but I, I actually really do hope that we can all be polite. I, I do want all of us to be polite, please. Okay. Um, my name is Amy Lauta. I'm an early intervention special education teacher at Duncan Holbert. I currently hold a bachelor's degree in international relations from one of the country's top universities. I also hold a master's degree in education with an emphasis on curriculum development and an emphasis on reading language arts. Additionally, I hold a multiple subject teaching credential and three special education credentials, mod severe, mild mod, and early childhood. I taught in Silicon Valley and Scott, Scotts Valley before coming to Pajaro Valley two years ago. I came here for three reasons. Number one, I have a passion for early intervention. I understand how critical it is to student success. Number two, I wanted to work in the community that I live and vote in. And number three, I wanted to work for my amazing principal and mentor, Michelle Scherer. I love my job. I stated my above qualifications not to boast because I know many of my colleagues are, uh, have the same qualifications. But to make a point, despite my education and my qualifications, I am missing out on time with my family tonight to fight for a $66 increase in my monthly salary. This is One extremely minute. demoralizing. I spend an average of twice that on supplies for my classroom out of pocket every month. My students benefit from thousands of dollars worth of materials that I have purchased over my 11 years of teaching. I did not enter the teaching profession to get rich. However, a little respect would be nice. When looking over the salary schedule, I noticed the cabinet get twice the stipend I do for a master's degree. They receive $3,600 to $39 per year. I receive $1,700 per year. And I ask why? A master's degree is a master's degree. The message that I receive when I see this kind of discrepancy is that teachers do not really matter to this district. Qualified teachers, in my opinion, are the one thing that you can't do without. We can do without fancy facilities, although they would be nice. We could do without a large technology budget, although that too would be nice. Besides a student's family and network, qualified teachers are the most important variable to a student's success, in my opinion. Pajaro Valley's actions and priorities do not seem to align with this. I often receive, fo receive phone calls from recruiters and people that I've worked with in the past. I could easily make 40% more over the hill. My youngest child will be graduating high school next year in 2021, and sadly, I will be considering those options when the commute will not be an impediment to my family. I know I am not alone. Please come to the table with a respectable offer for teacher salaries. Thank you. As you said, Daniel, out of respect for COVID-19. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and board members. Thank you for your time and your hard work. Uh, my name is Laura Azaro. I am an elementary school teacher with our district of 26, 27 years. I'm just reminding you, and I know you know this, but we are a people-driven profession. Our classified staff has been cut to almost a skeleton crew at our sites, which, is, which has affected the quality of the cleanliness of our schools. There's, there's just been a lot of layoffs over many years that just have never been replaced. Our class sizes are smaller now, thank you, and keep that going. Because you know what you experienced when we were all like upset and you felt like your whole meeting was gonna get hijacked? That's how many of us feel every day in our classes. And I'm not kidding. Thank, thankfully, we are getting trauma like instruction to help kids with trauma. Thankfully, we are getting some um, training on these because the kids that we are working with every day do what just happened to you, and but ramp it up. They are upset, and, and we have 
very solid structures, consistent routines in place. That's we have minute. good, tight behavior management. We are very loving people, but we're also, we have our expectations. I cannot even begin to tell you what happened in my class today, and I'm not going to because I don't have time, but I need a raise. We are negotiating. We have come down in our expectation and our raise. And I would like you to come up in yours. Let's see some movement happening. Find it. Make it a priority. Keep the money coming to the people closest to the kids. Don't take money away from the kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if they so desire, but like, you know, we at least came with the supply. Do we have a lady? Hello, my name is Lady Leon. I'm a senior at PV High School. I am here today because teachers deserve higher salaries. <laughs> Let's just take a step back and think in where we are right now. What each and every one of us has accomplished in their lifetimes up to today. Who made many of this happen? Yes, yourself, but also the help of teachers who have helped you develop the skills to thrive. Who taught who taught the leaders of the past and present to build and flourish an entire society? Teachers. Not all of us have the privilege of living in a stable home filled with love and support. Us as students spend the majority of the day at school. Many of our teachers have become not only someone who has taught us essential material, but been there to support and encourage us to have a successful future, or in other words, become part of our family. I myself have many teachers and counselors who I am very blessed to have in my life who continue to encourage me, support me, and push me beyond what I ever thought was possible. So let's give the teachers the respect they deserve and raise their salaries. Thank you. I can have the next three uh, come up. Um, Evelyn Polito, Adam Hioki, and Alejandra Rodriguez. On my way home from the last time I spoke here, my mom was amazed at how little attention some of the school board members gave towards the speakers. You should be concerned by this observation. I don't know what the requirements are to be a school board member, but is the ability to tune everyone out one of them? Now, I'm not saying this to ridicule you, but to simply bring to your attention the way you are treating those who stand before you. PVUSCT PS PVUSD wants to create brilliant, outspoken students who will enrich our community. But if we come and exercise our elaborate speaking and comprehension skills, you won't listen. Well, you might listen. You might half listen. You might look at me, take note of my tone, and then your eyes will gloss over as soon as you hear the anger in my voice. Are you listening to me right now? Dr. Rodriguez, are you paying attention to me right now? Are you hearing my plea for help on behalf of my teachers? Are you acknowledging my presence? Because you will be in three months from now when you reach out for a handshake during graduation. You'll be smiling and the senior class will shake your hand blindly not knowing who you are. Because I've never seen a lady in the red gown at PV. Have you? One minute. If you can't seem to acknowledge us now, don't acknowledge us then. And if you can't bear to listen to another teacher ask for a 1% raise now, then you should skip the graduation ceremony because you don't deserve to see the fruits of our teachers' labor. They deserve better. Give them what they deserve. Good evening. Uh, I have three pretty simple rules for my classroom to respect, reflect, and learn. And originally I hoped that over the next two minutes that you could do all three, but it looks like we'll have to do it in one. 
A 1% raise contingent on attendance, frankly, shows no respect for teachers, students, or the community. Do you earnestly believe that on top of all our other duties and responsibilities that we should also be truancy officers? <laughs> when I see empty seats in my classroom, I see students missing out on their education. Should I instead see a 1% raise shrinking to zero? It's demoralizing to know that while I'm spending extra uncompensated hours lesson planning and grading, writing letters of recommendation and calling parents, there are individuals in the district, on the board, dreaming up new ways to tell us that we aren't worthy of fair compensation. Two weeks ago, I watched one of my students stand where I am now and deliver a heartfelt, honest, and poignant speech, and I just watched her do it again a few seconds ago. You heard the same words that I did. You've had the same time to reflect on it that I have. We talk so much about putting students first and what would be best for them, but look around and how many of them have come out tonight to speak favorably of the position that you have taken. I don't know how much longer you can argue that you have their best interest at heart when you give offers to their teachers such as the one they have. That was one minute. The teachers in this room are role models day in and day out, and don't you want to be the same? When students ask us about district administrators and school board members, what do you want us to say? I hope that you can learn from these students just as many of us did in this room two weeks ago, just as many of us do every day in the classroom, and you can realize that this contract offer is inherently unfair. Thank you. Um, dear board members, I am writing you on behalf of the after school program staff at McQuitty. The letters to inform you that of the concern and stress added to our work environment due to the early release of Kathy Sinedos Mitani. Since day one, Ms. Mitani has been a major impact with her after school staff. She has treated all of us with respect and appreciation. Ms. Mitani has always been open to new ideas, being flexible and created a safe and happy environment where we all feel very united as a group. Because of her great leadership skills, Ms. Mitani has had a re really positive impact on how we perform in our jobs and how our students view us. They see how well we get along and support each other. We are good role models for our students. We function as a great team and that would not be possible if we didn't have her as a, such a great leader with, like Ms. Mitani. We were aware of the fact her job description has changed, therefore she will probably wasn't coming back next school year, and we totally understand that, but we were told that her last day is Thursday, March 12th, and no more explanation was provided. This has all, all of us concerned and stressed because we cannot run this program without a supervisor. We are being unreasonable all that all that we are asked is that she's able to stay un with us until the end of the school year. We don't want a new supervisor. M Ms. Mitani has already planned so many activities such as spring performance where all the students and parents participate. Without her, after school program will not function properly. Some of us work in the regular school and we have seen how stress and not just motivated some of the teachers are because they don't have the best leader. That ha was not the case for us having Ms. Natania as our administrator. She always makes sure we feel welcome and safe at work. If you deny us the opportunity of having her as our administrator until the end of the year. That was one minute, past one minute. Okay. Thank you. We're just not gonna show up as staff if we don't do anything. That's why we're here. We support our teachers. We, we need to be supported if we want to grow as a community. We are the only ones of staff that are from that school coming that we're not classified in. But we're here, we're not certified in, but we're classified in to work and we want us to be heard. So thank you. The next three people I have are Robin Reynolds, Emily Halbig, and Eli Reynolds. Robin Reynolds here? Yeah. Robin Reynolds is my wife. She's at home watching our baby, so I'm going to take her a minute because 
She could have emailed you with the comments, but she'd rather me speak for her than any of you. Um, I thought I was going to go first because I put my name on top, so that's what I planned in my head. But I'll go for her first because you said her name. Uh, she came to the last meeting because we switch off meetings because one of us has to watch her baby because I don't get paid enough to pay for a babysitter. Um, and she came home and said a couple smart things. If we have to be in all in every day, shouldn't everyone be all in every day? I've seen a lot of, she's seen a lot of uh, different paperwork with pays and salaries. I've been to a lot of meetings. I've heard of teachers sleeping on their parents' couches. My wife came home and said a great idea. She said, why doesn't our admin, why doesn't our superintendent, why doesn't our DO, why don't they take a voluntary freeze in pay? Because none of them have ever slept on a couch because they can't pay for it. I work in special ed, and she worked in special ed. We change diapers. We do all these things that we don't think we should have to do. And then we have to come home and still cook dinner every night because we can't afford to go out and just pick up dinner. So I want admin, she wants admin, to take a voluntary freeze in pay because you make enough money for five years. Use some of that money to pay us. That was one minute. And then we'll be good. All right, now we're going to Eli Reynolds because I think that was next. Um, I had a whole speech planned for me until I heard um, our boss, Ms. Dr. Rodriguez, give her a little speech. My speech changed. So you said you were very proud in the middle of your COVID-19 disclaimer that the, they took our procedures from our district. And we got a lot of emails saying you're going to give us supplies, you're going to clean our classrooms. Last night, one of our custodians was sick, and we got an email said, all they did was picked up your trash, you didn't get vacuum, you didn't get anything else. So thanks for making the procedures, but thanks for not using them on us. Secondly, uh, you put the budget and the salary percentages up there. Um, cost of living. We're 30% in California, but we're in the top 10% of cost of living. If you want us to live here and work here, pay us. I tried to stay under my two minutes, but I had a lot more to say. I could say a lot more, but I don't think I'm coming back because I love my family and I don't really want to deal with this anymore. So do something and I'm not coming to work except from 7.30 or 7.15 to 2.45 from now on. No other time. Emily, you had a slide, is that correct? Yeah, I do have. Uh, it's the sheet that's been passed around, and I wanted to thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for noticing it and Mike, looking at the Mike numbers. And I'm scared to get closer to it. I don't yeah. want to get too close. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm the one who made this flyer, which is up there in color. And um, I'm, I'm not a math teacher, but I am a meticulous researcher. And so I know Dr. Riguez, Rodriguez spoke to the numbers, but I want to share the research that I did and how I came to the conclusions that I did to help clarify any um, misconfusion. And then I'd also like to say that maybe we can sit down and meet and look at the numbers together side by side because I also got my research from the CDE website and I also pulled a lot of data from the PVUSD um, school accountability report card for last year. So um, I'm just going to kind of go down from the top. Um, the first thing to point out is the difference in salary, right? 16000 is our the difference in what our average teacher makes and what the average teacher makes in the state of California. The you know, defense of the district has always been we can't pay you more because we give you great benefits. It's true. We do have great benefits. We appreciate that. However, when I looked at the line, there were 19 lines in the J90 document on the CDE website that show the different plans for the school district's health benefits. Those averaged out, which it took me a while to calculate, comes out to about $21,000 contribution on average per teacher. I have one dependent, and my, the contribution for the district on my contract was $22,000 for this year, so I think that's about right. Now, the state of California average for health and welfare benefits is $14,000. I got that from an EdSource article that talks about how they need to revamp the whole um, health care system. The difference between those two numbers is 9,500. Okay, that's a lot. So I don't think that asking for a small raise that we're asking for is out of the question. In fact, I believe that we should get that whole 9,500 in our paychecks. Okay, so that's the why. Now I want to talk about the how. So I looked at the district's budget to about 260 million dollars. I know I, I I'm almost done. 
And the main thing, as I pointed out, is the 27% and the 35%. Now that number came from the district's school accountability report card. It's on your own website. It says 27%. It doesn't say 30%, as Dr. Rodriguez explained. Now what I assume is because maybe they, were, they lumped in the administrator certificated sa um, salaries in there as well. But anyway, either way, what I'd like to do is see where you got your numbers, and then we can compare with mine and see what the discrepancy is. Lastly, you know, the cost of living issue, it's 32%, it costs 32% more to live in this part of the state than it does average in the state. We're not asking for 32% more than the average salary. We are asking for somewhere close to the average salary. That's what we would like. Thank you very much. The next three speakers I have are Nancy Jackson, Elizabeth Thorne, and Sonia Quintero. My name is Nancy Jackson. I have been a teacher at Start Elementary for 28 years. Um, I have to say I'm incredibly demoralized and discouraged to be here again. What is this? If I've been here 30 years, this is my 10th contract cycle that I've had to come and beg that the board acknowledge the worth of teachers. Um, I'm asking that the board acknowledge by negotiating in earnest, okay, by offering something that we can respond to. We're willing to respond. We've come down in our initial offers. We understand that the Pajaro District is feeling the pinch by declining enrollment, driven in part by increasing rents, as well as a pinch through increased benefit costs. This is a cost, a dynamic that all people feel these days. Teachers feel it on a very personal level, okay? We pay higher rents, we pay higher um, benefit costs for our loved ones to live safe and to live healthy. I'm gonna continue. I'd like to say also that it's far more, a uh, much higher percentage of my personal income than any administrator in the district. I have dedicated my entire adult working life to the community that lives in the six block radius around Pennsylvania and Hammer Drive. And I've done it gladly. And I've done it with pleasure and I've done it with dedication because it's extremely rewarding work but I'm not feeling the love from you at all. Like, ni una poquito, okay? Um, I wanna say that the cynicism in your offer of 1% in the face of my dedication, dedicating my entire work, adult life to the community, is offensive. And it's infuriating, and I'm pretty tired of it, and it's forcing me to do something that, um, I don't want to do, which is to withdraw my uncompensated work. My uncompensated work that is equals to 20, 30 hours a week, I am going to start working to my contract hours. That is 8 to 3.30. That was one Whatever I can one get minute. done in that time, I get done. What I don't, I don't. I don't do this gladly. I don't do it with pleasure. I do it because I expect my work and my dedication to be acknowledged with a fair offer that we can negotiate with. Does that make sense? Is that reasonable? Okay, everybody's feeling the same dynamics. You are going to need a much longer term solution than squeezing teachers for the ADA for your lost revenue. You are going to need a structural change that addresses declining enrollment. And it cannot be done on the backs of teachers. Yeah. Teachers have enough on their back already. Thank you.
And right now, I'm also being asked to go and teach people how to clean their classrooms, okay? I have to teach the aides how to clean in their classrooms. I was told I had to go, uh, one day's notice to go to a mandatory meeting to learn how to teach these people how to clean their classrooms that actually was scheduled to go beyond my work day. That was one minute. Thank you. I'm almost done. It's not okay to schedule meetings that go beyond my work day that I'm being told, and I got an email tonight saying, how come you didn't attend this mandatory meeting? even though I had a previous scheduled meeting with my administration that I couldn't get out of, and I had a one-day notice to go to this. Another one's going to be scheduled, and I'll be happy to go. But my caseload is ridiculous. My caseload is ridiculous, and we need more nurses. Okay? <laughs> Carolyn has four schools herself. Okay? So it's not just me. And thank you. If you don't mind... I'm going to leave a few more wipes up here in case people feel like they need them. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening to all. Um, I was here last week, or should I say the last board meeting, and I'm here again for the same cause, but I just want to tell you my name is Sonia Quintero and I work at Calabasas Elementary as a first grade teacher and I've worked here in this district for about 25 years and I really enjoy working with the community. I love the families and we, we are all here because we care about our students and support their learning. Um, each year you budget for programs and activities to just for that effect to support our students learning. Yet. You don't budget for a decent wage increase for our teachers. This doesn't make sense. If you value our students' education, this should be a priority. Investing in teachers is investing in, in quality education for our students. This will ensure our teachers to stay here. On, on the current offer of the 1% increase, tied into attendance amongst students. I found out that when a student moves, the school site has to keep marking that student absent until a QM has been requested by the new school. So it doesn't make that criteria for attendance att uh, attainable. There are needs to be a separate record for these students that they are no longer on our site. The 1% attendance rate contingency is an insult and is an absurd, is absurd. They say that actions speak louder than words. So please show us the respect that you value what we do for our students by giving us a decent wage increase. Thank you. Our next three are Greg Tucker, Joan Lings Whistler, and Eileen Clark Nagoka. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I really, I've done so much talking to district administration through negotiations that I don't really know that I want to say very much more. Um, but I, I felt obligated when, at the start of this board meeting tonight, a slide was put up there with a bunch of data without context. I felt obligated as a teacher to point out that data without context is used to silence, not educate. And, and so when Emily came up a little while ago and kind of helped to kind of make sense of some of the data that she had and, and explained her sourcing for that data, that's, that's actually education. That's not shut up and go away. And um, unfortunately, that may not be the intent of the presentation of the slide at the start, but that's how it reads. So, you know, thanks. Good evening, I'm Joan Ling Swizzler and I teach at Pacific Coast Charter School. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about attendance. At PCCS, we do attendance very differently. Um, it's a homeschooling and independent uh, study charter school, and so kids actually do not need to attend school. Um, they do their studies at home or elsewhere with, um, for elementary, middle, 
which I teach uh, with a parent usually at home teaching them. Um, so I've only been at the school for, this is my third year. Um, however, from my very first few months, it was astounding to me how many kids were coming to us, not because they intended to be homeschooled, but because they've, they'd suffered trauma, because they are being bullied, because they had anxiety, because they had depression, because they had medical issues that could not be addressed by teachers or uh, the um, scant staff that was actually there to help their social emotional needs. And so, um, you know, well, a minute already. <laughs> um, so uh, we are getting so many of these kids that um, they are desperate for another place to be because they cannot physically come to school. Their parents are trying to get them to come to school, but they're so anxious they cannot. We happen to have really good attendance because we do our attendance in such a different way. But what about the kids who can't be homeschooled? What if their parents are working full time? What if they're in kindergarten One and minute. their parents need to make a living? Those parents can't do what our, our families do. And uh, I think it's just a shame that teachers are being asked to encourage those kids to go to school. Some of my students did not have science, did not have math, or did not have a teacher in SELPA for months at a time. They had subs who were on their phones because there were not enough uh, people applying for those positions because it pays too low. So please take a look at the budget and see if you can find some money for the teachers because what we're doing directly affects the students and we deserve a living wage. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Eileen Clark Nagoka. I'm a kindergarten teacher at um, H.A. Hyde School. I've been teaching, um, I think, more than 30 years. I've lost track. But I, um, I wanted to just say how, how touched I've been by the teachers that have spoken and um, so eloquently, and, and uh, especially about the love we have for the work we do. And, and that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Um, and just to say as well that um, it, it felt to me like a joke when I first heard that our, our salary increase was going to be based on increase in attendance. I, I really thought it was a joke, and it is a joke, actually, <laughs> but, but because it's, it's so insane. I mean, the subtext of that is that we don't teach well enough to attract, to bring our, our students, that we're not giving enough in, we're not putting enough in to have an engaging curriculum, I, I don't know how else I can take that. Um, and the other point I'd like to make quickly is just that, uh, just to finish up, that we spend so much money on curriculum that we have for a year and we throw it out because of the- That was one minute. Be because of the, the disorganization in, in, in our district office or, or something. I don't know what, people don't talk to each other, people don't, uh, you know, um, have the same goals. I'm not sure, and I just read that one of the one of the things that's being um, asked for for next year is uh, more SIPS consultants. We have an army of SIPS people already teaching. Um, I, I can't some of the people, some of the TOSAs, and some of the classroom teachers have already been trained um, do that training instead of spending 50, I think it's $52,000. Um, it just seems like common sense to, to not do these things, that you, to pay into redundancy like that, and common sense also to invest in your most valuable research, which is research, res, resource, which is teachers. Thank you. Next we have John Bland, and is it Maya Lord? Okay. This is a tough one, guys. I, I, uh, one minute, huh? This is tough. I had, I'm kind of doing an audible adjustment. Sorry, I had the kid. I just got here. Basically, I was going to read my cover letter that I've, I've sent out. I, I was going to read the cover letter that I sent out to a couple of jobs that pay $18,000 and one pays $44,000 more, and they're pr public schools. But I can't do that. I um, do want to, I just want to read something very briefly that I wrote you guys, and, um, uh, yeah, it's called math, not English. I'm an English teacher. Uh, I wanted to quickly say two things. Thank you for your hard work, and I do really mean that. Um, 
and my family can't afford for me to work at this district. Uh, my name is John Bland. I'm the English teacher at PBHS, and I'm also the interim chair. <clears throat> I'll be brief, and I'll paint with broad strokes. I take home 3300 My rent is 2800 I spend $60,000 on education to become a teacher. I have all the other bills folks have, and when it adds up, the juice is not worth the squeeze. I can't afford to teach at this district, and I absolutely love my, my students. Uh, I want to teach these kids, not over the hill. But it's not about English, it's about math. I can't afford to teach at PVSD. Please approve the raise requested by PVFT. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maya Lord, and I'm a second grade teacher here in PVSD. Um, I'm just about to finish my second year. Um, I come from ECE. I was a preschool teacher for five years, uh, living with poverty wages at 24,000 a year. And um, I made the, sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> I made the switch to become an ele elementary school teacher for a chance at a better life and health insurance for my disabled husband. <sighs> I'm overjoyed with my switch. I love my students, I love this community, I love my co coworkers and the families I work with. Um, I want to stay in this di district. I'm passionate and I believe in this work, but here's the reality. For $1,500 a month, I live in a converted concrete garage with no heat. It's an illegal and unsafe structure to live in, but it's all we can afford. I don't even have a bathroom inside. Yes, even in the winter, I have to shower outside with a hose. I have hopes and dreams just like my students. I one dream minute. and hope that I can maybe have the stability of owning a home one day, raise a family, and care for my disabled husband, and be a great teacher. Giving me a 1% raise is just one small step towards that. Thank you. And I did receive the emailed comments. I'll start with Melissa Dennis from Maloney Elementary School. I would like to speak tonight about teacher pay raise attached to attendance increase. I believe that the district can afford a raise for teachers. We deserve it and we need, to, we need it to keep and attract quality teachers in our district. I don't believe we will be able to achieve 97% attendance despite all our best efforts. We try to improve attendance all the time, but some circumstances are out of our hands. Let's end the stalemate and give the teachers what they're asking for and what they deserve. Next, from Nerissa Graydon. The coronavirus has been declared a pandemic and our county has a current outbreak. The prudent thing to do is to close the schools for 14 days. 175 students come through my classroom every day. The virus lives on all surfaces for nine days. My students are being forced to choose academics over their health, and as a teacher, I am being forced to choose money over my health. Keeping schools open to avoid loss of money and hysteria is putting all students and staff in harm's way. Please put health first and close the schools for a deep cleaning. From Deborah Mallard, Dr. Rodriguez and board trustees, I would like to address you regarding the, the COVID uh, 19 outbreak as it relates to the 97% attendance rate contingent on a 1% teacher raise. More than ever, we do not want sick students attending school. All the new policies adopted with the county health department push for social isolation and people who are sick to stay home. Now more than ever, this attendance contingency for a 1% raise is completely out of the control of PVFT members. This contingency needs to be dropped as part of our ongoing negotiations. Also, the salary comparisons made in the district's flyer with Hemet and Coachella in San Bernardino County, California are completely unrelated to the cost of living here in Santa Cruz County. The prices for housing alone in these two spots, Hemet and Coachella, are one-third to one-half of what the costs are out here, data from rentcafe.com. To compare teacher salaries in PVUSD to these cherry-picked districts is a manipulation of data to support PVUSD's low salaries. We are not fooled. Pay teachers fairly, retain good teachers, do what is best for students. Thank you. From Ryan Olivas. 
How, is that a little better? Okay. So from Ryan Olivas, I am a special education teacher at PV High and am unable to come to the board meeting tonight, but wanted to share some thoughts with you as my representative on the board. I love PV, the Student Body Collective is inspiring to teach. They are dedicated to improving themselves and greater society as a whole. My students recognize the difference between high and low quality instruction and understand and value that high quality instruction comes from well-trained, dedicated teachers. They also keenly understand economic forces such as wage, cost of living, and housing expenses and are aware that the teaching profession as a whole is grossly undercompensated. My students demand and receive high quality instruction because I ensure it and would like to see my dedication rewarded with a salary increase so that I can continue to live and work in this wonderful community. Thank you for your time and service. From, let's see, from Kristen Prestridge. Dear members of the PVUSD Board of Trustees, are you aware that a teacher in the PVUSD would need to work in the district for 12 years before working his or her way out of poverty? According to the city of Santa Cruz, 68,000 is the threshold for an individual to be considered above the poverty, poverty level. It takes 12 years of full-time employment with the district to reach that step on the salary schedule. We need to do better for our students by paying teachers a living wage. Teachers are the single most important factor in a student's education, and here in the, P in the PVUSD, we don't have enough of them. Why? Because, we can't, because they can't afford to work here. All of our students deserve a credentialed teacher every day. Every day, too many of our students are taught by an uncredentialed or substitute teacher. We can do better. Pay teachers the professional wage they need to live and work in this unique and wonderful community. Sincerely, Kristen Prestridge. From Maya Campbell, dear PVUSD Board of Trustees, we the staff of Landmark Elementary School would like to bring to your attention current library conditions that are negatively affecting our students and teachers. On January 31st, our school library was closed due to suspected mold contamination. Our library media technician followed the PVUSD mold standard operating procedure from July 2019. The district's SOP states that an environmental hygienist will be hired, testing and reports will be published and shared with the cabinet and affected sites within four to six weeks. This Friday, March 13th, will mark six weeks since our library was closed. Our staff has repeatedly asked for updates and received none. To our knowledge, testing has not even begun. We are very concerned. We want you to be aware of the ways this closure is negatively affecting our school. We only have access to 8% of our circulation. We have no access to books to support our academic curriculum and units. Our students, many of whom rely on the library books to complete homework and early literacy practice, are limited to checking out one book per week from a very limited selection. Almost all of the bilingual books our students gravitate towards are no longer available to support biliteracy. We encourage the board to prioritize literacy and follow their own SOP to open our library as quickly as possible, keeping all staff and families together in the process. From Caitlin Johnson. Thank you for taking my comments via email. I'm a PVUSD arts educator with more than 20 years teaching for PVUSD. At the last board meeting, I heard about the upcoming PVUSD recruitment fair, and it got me to thinking about what I would say to a new teacher considering beginning their career here. I'll start with the positive. Why work at PVUSD? Excellent health benefits. Thank you. Fabulous kids and family and community. Hardworking, smart, and dedicated colleagues. A, a colleagues. A beautiful county to live in. An engaged board and superintendent. Reasons not to teach for PVUSD. Low pay compared to the cost of living. A new teacher could make 10000 more over the hill or in Salinas. Abysmal working conditions, overcrowded, filthy, decrepit, and unsafe facilities in classrooms, or in some cases like mine, no classroom at all. Not enough support personnel, no classroom maids, not enough nurses, counselors, safety supervisors, not enough custodians, too large class sizes. Chronic teacher shortages and high turnover, not enough special ed teachers, substitute, math, science, not enough bilingual, not enough arch teachers, not enough intervention teachers, and the exhausting cycle of having to return to the negotiating table every couple of years. From Omar Guzman, 
Hello, with what is going on with the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think it's smart to have negotiations about the contract proposal that hinges on a 1% salary increase on raising attendance? Teachers do so much, and now you want them to do even more for a 1% increase. That is a joke. The reason I emailed is that shouldn't these negotiations be put on hold? Since many teachers and members of the community will come to the board meeting to express their feelings, there may, some may not come knowing they have COVID-19. We need to look after our teachers and community members. I hope the board puts this on hold. From Kathleen Machado. As a teacher at RHMS, I am concerned with the short closer, closure of Rio. I had two students from Rio at my home this weekend, and my daughter is about to go to a soccer practice this evening with them. My daughter attends Aptos Junior, so there are three schools that are linked. How is PVUSD addressing this cross-school contamination? Also, without wipes, I know how people are allergic. How am I supposed to get the Chromebooks cleaned in between my five classes of 35 students? We need the Chromebooks cleaned more often than the promised deep clean I was told would happen soon by our site tech. Help me understand all of this. From Rebecca Royston. My name is Rebecca Royston from Radcliffe Elementary. I'm actually forward in a comment for Agenda 6.1 from a colleague, Michelle Connery. Here's her comment. My name is Michelle Connery, and I'm a first grade teacher at Radcliffe Elementary School. In taking precautions towards COVID-19, I decided not to attend this evening. As a union, we continue to fight for a higher salary for, us for so many reasons. Tonight, I wanted to share my reason. My husband and I have an almost two-year-old daughter, and we really want to have another child in the near future. But when it comes down to it, we sadly realize that we can't afford to have another child. It boggles my mind how two college graduates with full-time careers cannot afford to have a second child. I resent your offer to tie a 1% raise to increase attendance, both because it would do little to help teachers afford more and because of the implication that myself and other teachers are not already doing everything we can to encourage attendance. This new attendance hype is something we do every day. We want our kids in class just as much as you. The benefits to their education and health are clear to us already, and it's insulting to think that we don't want the very best for our students. Every teacher I know works every day for the best for their students, knowing that support we provide daily is vital for their continued growth. From Nicole Beverly. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and fellow board members. Thank you for taking your time to read my comments. I just want to address the ongoing negotiations between the district and PVFT. It is very disheartening to know that you think as teachers we are responsible for student attendance and getting our students to school every day, especially in the times we are in right now. We as teachers can plan and prep and make our lessons as engaging as possible, but we cannot get the students to school and putting these stipulations on a raise is only showing that you do not find teacher salary as a necessity in your budget. I actually did the math one day with my own class and found that to get 97% of my class there on one day, I have to have 100% of my students there, there. It is impossible for me to get 97% if I have even one student absent. With one student absent, it puts my percentage at 96%. I hope you all realize that this is an unrealistic expectation, and we know that you can do better for us teachers. <laughs> From Laura Feistel, we deserve at least a COL raise, especially in this area. Please make that a priority. Dear trustees, my name is Micah Powell and I'm a history teacher at PVHS. I am urging you to vote no on the upcoming budget vote on March 11th, specifically no on any budget that contains teachers raises with contingency language such as increasing student attendance. The current office from PVSD of a 1% raise tied to a 97% attendance rate is an insult and absurd. The role of educators is to assist students in their growth and development, not to monitor their attendance, which we have no control of. Please consider the complexities of my nearly 200 students' attendance habits and ask yourself if it's fair to tie that to the way I provide for my family. Please understand that the current offer from the district is asking us teachers to correlate students' attendance with our paycheck. That is wrong. There doesn't seem to be any compromise on the part of district negotiators in our current struggle for a fair contract. We as a union have come down from our original ask for a cost of living increase, yet we are still being offered the same ridiculous contingency tied to student attendance. That is wrong. Students should be tied to the high cost of living in this area and to the sacrifice that teachers 
teachers make in our dedication. In the last four years, my rent has increased by $600 per month. I am a 14-year veteran in this district and I struggled to pay my bills. This is wrong. From Barbara Knapp. To the school board and Dr. Rodriguez, I am making this comment in response to the district's office of offer of compensation to the hardworking teachers of PVSD. With all due respect, the offer of a 1% raise based on a 97% attendance rate is absurd. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is the most illustrative example of why this offer is an empty gesture. It's insulting. I am at the higher end of the pay scale, which means a 1% raise is about $40 a month. Ridiculous. A brand new teacher in this district would see a raise of $26 a month. $26. I can't help but think of the sexism behind an offer like this. We all know that teaching is a female-dominated profession, thus the low wages and the unbelievable disregard for our ability to fend for ourselves. This district complains about spending 82% on their uh, budget on salaries, but police departments and fire departments, both male-dominated professions, spend at least 90% of their budgets on salaries. I am also deeply concerned about this district's impact on our environment. Continued low pay makes it impossible for teachers to live in the district in which they work. That means longer commute times, which means more fossil fuels being burned, adding to climate change. What's innovative about that? In closing, I want to remind everyone here that this district gives a lot of lip service to being an all-in, but the only people who are truly all-in are the teachers. From Stephanie Hedgepeth Lopez, I am a third generation PVSD teacher. In addition, my parents, sisters, and I, my husband, and three children are all educated in PVSD schools. We all graduated from PVSD schools. We are currently members of the PVSD community. As part of that community, I want to ensure that the younger members of the community grow up as educated citizens. In order for that to happen, PVSD needs to show some support for their teachers. As I get closer to retirement, I want to be sure that we attract the best individuals to continue to educate the community, my community. And the district needs to show their support by attracting and keeping those, those young, bright teachers by increasing their pay so they can afford to live in and enjoy this community as I have done for practically my entire life. Raise the pay level of our newest teachers to keep them here and do not continue to offer the insulting raise attached to attendance, especially in this time of a global health emergency. Thank you for your time. Stay in good health. From Israel Castro, I just want to share something now that Rio Elementary is in quarantine. I'm a special education teacher at Calabasas Elementary. Many of our service providers, OT, speech, PT, psychologists, st st service students at Rio, service students at Rio, and there might be a possibility that staff might have come in contact with the virus. If so, the likelihood of virus spreading within schools is great due to the staff coming in and going between schools. I was also there three weeks ago for a meeting. Please take that the latter into account when considering reasons to close schools. I share this for the health and safety of all our schools and communities. From Jose Serrano, as a matter of equity and well-being, we seek salary increases for early childhood educators. Preschool teachers within the district's Child Education Development Department are the lowest paid staff within the district. Janitorial staff earn more. Secretarial staff earn more. Administrative personnel earn exponentially more. Preschool teachers are tasked with ensuring safety and security of their students while also facilitating students' socio-emotional development, positive academic adjustment. As students' first classroom experience, preschool would, should be reasonably resourced and staffed by competent and equitably compensated teachers. Please help us strengthen to strengthen the future academic performance of our youngest students by adequately resourcing preschool classrooms. We can do this by attracting and retaining skilled and dedicated early childhood educators by improving teachers' salaries to be on par with a living wage. Preschool teachers are not asking for a handout. We want a leg up. We want to earn enough to support our families so we can also support yours. To the board members, thank you for your personal dedication to the students and families of our district, which you demonstrate continuously. To our teaching colleagues, um, we in early edu childhood education appreciate the continued support of our K-12 colleagues. Thank you, uh, Manuel Serrano, uh, Bradley State Preschool. <laughs> From Rocio Pantoja, I'm writing to question the decision to remove um, Kathy Matani from McQuitty Elementary as VP after school coordinator. Kathy has successfully fulfilled this position for many years. 
She is loved by staff, students, and parents. She has done nothing short of going above and beyond her duties. This year in particular, she has been critical in implementing PBIS and in the attempt to rebuild a McQuitty School culture of trust, respect, and community. Why weren't we as staff asked about her performance? Shouldn't our input count? We work with her every day. We entrust our students to her. Our opinion of her should be very important to you. More importantly, what does this say about our principal? We teach our students to solve problems. What does it say to you, to us, to our students and families that her solution was to have Kathy removed? This is not solving problems. She is simply removing her problem. We solve problems is what we teach, what she preaches, and yet she isn't practicing what she is preaching to our students. I am disappointed that whomever supported and made the decision did not care to be well informed or educated on the situation. I hope that you show our community and our students that you are responsible enough to look into a mistake, fix it, and facilitate a conversation to actually solve whatever the problem may be. From Becca Berryman. Hello, my name is Becca and I'm a teacher at Calabasas. I used to teach in the Central Valley and with my pay difference here versus there is only 1,500 per year, yet my cost of living is exactly double here. How is it possible for me to sustain myself with that kind of pay? Please tell me how I am supposed to someday buy a home or even have children. This type of pay is not sustainable to live in this county. The email you sent out comparing our salaries to other districts was just insulting. I know how little my pay is. I don't need your graphic to remind me. Please consider teachers like myself who absolutely love teaching here. I love my students. I love my fellow teachers. I love my Calabasas community. But pay, this pay is just not sustainable. Please tell me how you feel OK with pushing away a very passionate teacher purely because you won't loosen your tight purse strings. From Christina Carter, I am a first grade bilingual teacher at Minty White. I want to thank the Board of Trustees and PVUSD for the continued excellent health benefits for me and my family. I am aware of the 7% increase this year. However, I do not believe this shows enough to the teachers of the district that you value us and our vital work with students. I am especially concerned about new teachers who don't even make 50000 barely a living wage for a professional. Last month, I asked the Board to dig deep. This time, please really analyze the budget and have the guts to prioritize us. If you truly value our work and our students, our union has bargained in good faith, lowering and adjusting salary requests and not stipulating impossible attendance contingencies. 1900 on each salary cell is, is fair. Where can you move that $2.5 million from? Prioritize students and your employees on the front lines, in service, in the front lines of service to them. Thank you. From Laura Arnau, in light of the coronavirus outbreak now definitively present in our district, I find it increasingly dangerous that teachers are being asked to compete for high attendance rates instead of encouraging our students to protect our community by staying home when sick. Tying salaries to high attendance flies in the face of public health science at this dangerous time. And And then from Stephanie Lefevre, I am deeply concerned about the safety of our students in PVUSD. There was a confirmed case of COVID-19 at Rio Del Mar resulting in school closure. And then today, five to eight staff members from Rio came to HA Hyde for a training that took place inside my kindergarten, kindergarten autism classroom. The only way to prevent this from spreading is social distancing now, not waiting for it to spread through the schools. As a board member, you have the power and responsibility to prevent this. Please act now to keep all students, staff, and families safe. Thank you. And I don't have any further public comments. Thank you very much. Next agenda item 7. Point we want justice. What do we want? PVFT. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. Is PVFT the representative here? 7.1? I get up here um, I think that first of all good evening board 
um, thank you for those of you those of you who've come out. Uh, you've, you've heard some pretty powerful testimonials, and they're real. And they're also, um, any type of data that was presented to you was data. You guys like data, right? So um, some of the, <coughs> I've been like really busy look, working on other, uh, other projects, or many, the many different projects that, that uh, Roddy and I work on, um, and meetings that we attend. Um, <laughs> so thank you for acknowledging, Dr. Rodriguez, that PBFT should be part of, of the communications, like being notified when a school site is going to be affected, because those people are our members as well. Um, and CSEA should hopefully also have been um, notified. <coughs> so first or second interim report. Um, because, you know, it's numbers that we're always looking at. Where is the money for a raise in this meager budget that we have? Um, I, we pointed it out in negotiations, and so I'll let you know. Line item 4300 in the SACS report. Thank you, Joe, for updating, for correcting the SACS report. Um, <coughs> first of all, the board approved back in July a budget of about 9.6 million for this object code. And then um, when you revised the budget, you increased it by um, 2.3 million, so now it's at like $12 million. So as of January 31st, you have spent 3.4 million. So you still have a pretty good chunk of money um, in that that has not been used. The, I'm just looking at 4,300 materials and supplies. If you want to look at the total books and supplies, the totals, you have not. The district is going to end their year with money there. According to your um, interim report, a 1% with statutories is $858,487 for um, Gosh, I hope I'm looking at the right one <laughs> for us, for our unit. So what we're asking for as far as salary goes, we're asking to restructure the salary schedule so that we can address the needs of our newer teachers and um, offer them a, a, a wage. According to MIT study for this county, it is about 50, 57000 to to be able to just make it, maybe, if you can find, unfortunately, you know, a, a something livable, a converted garage. Um, and I live on the west side in Santa Cruz, and I watch the homes in my neighborhood sell for an amazing amount of money, and homes that will need another amazing amount of money just to remodel to make it livable. <coughs> so um, I just lost my point. <laughs> Um, basically, you have money. You're going to end with some money. Yes, the district has been deficit spending because you did have at some one point an incredible reserve. And yes, we're no longer in those years of extra money coming in because we're done with the um, the uh, LCFF, the, the that extra money coming in that we got. It all got paid out last year. We know. We get it. So we're down just to COLA years. But we still have that money. We had it last year when we started negotiating to restructure the salary schedule, and it was put off. We had that money. That raise could have happened prior to July 1st. People could have come to work with a settled contract at the very beginning of this school year. You could have helped make that happen. And instead, it's just another how many teachers are going to show up and pick it on the side of the road. Maybe your job applicate, your job ad should be a picture of teachers and then have like a couple of spaces underneath signs. Like this could be you, you know, because it's ridiculous. I've been in the district for 13 years and 
my kids grew up on the picket line. They grew up holding up signs. So the money is there. This raise could have happened at the beginning of the year. And then you guys come back to the table because everybody in the district office has to that look at the numbers minutes. and adjust. Um, and we wouldn't be here in this situation. Um, there are a couple of things on your <laughs> on this agenda that I hope that you ask to have more of a discussion before you make a decision. Um, 9.5 on um, 9 point, well, let's start with 8.3. That's a $56,000 um, wage contract for SIPs. I'm sure you could find some people in the district who can um, run this. And 9.5, we're finally gonna go to the table and begin um, negotiating over the learning center model. <laughs> but this, to bring in a consultant for that, not necessary. So I'm hoping that maybe this board will start a new trend of asking to maybe interview teachers at sites that have already experienced some of these consultants coming through before you make give the okay for the district to just show you, oh, here's your three days of looking over this consultant contract. We really need it. But you haven't heard anything from the teachers in regards to, is that really going to be very valuable? Or is that just gonna create more work on the teacher? So I hope that you start a new trend and, at, and beginning to ask to, let, let's let, hear about it and then I wanna go meet some teachers and have an actual discussion about it before you vote on something so serious because that's money that you're giving away. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, agenda item 7.2, CACA. Representative from CACA. Okay. 7.3, uh, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. 7.4, Communication Workers of America. Oh, all right. Uh, 8.1, the 2019-2020 second interim financial report by Joe Dominguez. So good evening, uh, Board President Dodge Jr., Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board, administration, and members of the public. Uh, this evening, uh, myself along with Helen and Colleen will be presenting the second interim report, and uh, we will um, walk through our um, current situation, what we're facing. It is not working here. So the interim report, um, the deadlines for interim reports and certifications are clearly specified for school districts in California. And for county government, that's Ed Code 1240. For K-12 or public school districts, it's 40, uh, 42130 and 42131. And we must, after uh, the reporting ending, we must file within 45 days our second interim report for that report being um, covered. This is a mandatory state legal requirement for all districts in California. The second interim is different in, from the first interim because it covers a period or window in time of our expenditures and revenues. So the first interim covers July 1 to October 31st. The second interim covers July 1 through January 31st. And it also updates projections for the balance of the year. So any uh, uh, additional revenue and or expenditures, it's updated within the report and what the impact of that is to our budget. The report, um, as I mentioned, uh, are due to the, to the county and then the state, uh, California Department of Education, by March 16th, and that is the 45 days. One of the items that I need to stress to our board and uh, to PVSD 
is if we fail to approve the second interim report this evening based on Ed Code 42130, our County Superintendent of Santa Cruz County Office of Education will not send our apportionment of state and or county funding for PUSD. Uh, furthermore, uh, which is uh, very alarming, we will not be approved any warrants. So the day-to-day -day operations of our district would cease. That includes payroll uh, for classified and certificated staff. Um, that even includes our premiums to our health and welfare benefits. Um, other items that are also covered are PG&E, so keeping the lights on, uh, not only at the district office, but school sites throughout the whole district. The sense of urgency and student safety, we would not be able to pay or order cleaning supplies for the coronavirus, um, hire or pro, um, provide staffing and or contract for services for cleanup or deep cleaning throughout our campuses. And it's talk about being student centered. This would be a negative impact to student activities, sports, music and art materials and uh, functions and instructional materials. So I wanna stress that and just let you know the magnitude if we do not pass our second interim. I do have positive news tonight that we, as a district, we come before you this evening with a positive certification based on the Ed Code. We will meet our current and subsequent two fiscal years, um, and we can meet those financial obligations. I'm not going to, this was a lot of hard work, and I'd like to also thank our superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez, for her leadership um, and taking the initiative to make sure that we may remain positive. Um, this was a very difficult task in itself um, because we as a district, and we mentioned this in previous presentations, we are not funded on a national level here in California uh, to cover our day-to-day -day expenditures. And we'll go through that through the presentation, but that includes transportation, our SELPA, and other uh, areas where it's a structural deficit because we have the lack of state funding to cover our expenses. Our second interim assumptions, we have the 180 uh, contracted days of instructional days. Uh, one of the, the big items that I really wanna stress and, and point out, and I'm very worried about it, is our enrollment loss. For 1920, we had 387 students uh, declining a loss of enrollment. For 2021, the projection is an additional loss of 512 students. And for 21-22, it's an additional 476 on top of that. I questioned our demographer and the experts that assist the district and the forecasts and assumptions. We did a five-year trend analysis back in time and their variance was less than 1%. So their projections have been spot on. And because of that, we are projecting that decline enrollment in the current and outgoing years. That impacts our funding and even stresses the importance to maintain or enhance our, uh, our attendance campaigns all in every day of our average daily attendance. So if you look at the bottom, an ADA is a percent of enrollment. We are have in our assumptions a 96% uh, percentage of ADA. For 2021, we see that increase of half percent to 96.5. And for the 21-22, we have projected at a 97%. So what we're saying is, even though we're declining as a district, the students that we still have in the classrooms in our community, we need to make sure they attend school and look at the various initiatives that we have in place to make that happen. In doing so, that also helps us maintain the positive certification. Our funded LCFF based on ADA is also decreasing due to the loss of enrollment. And so you see that at the last um, row. To furthermore stress this point of loss of enrollment and our projected declining enrollment. Since 2014-15, as a district, PVSD has lost approximately 2,000 students in that period of time. In 1920, as I mentioned, we went from 17,000 
963 down to 17,581, a loss of 387. And if you look at the bar graph, you see at 2021, from 17,581 to 17,069 students, a loss of 512. And 21-22, you see that loss of 476. We do show that we have the ADA percentage um, of ADA. Health and welfare is an uncontrollable cost that we cannot um, handle as a district. We, uh, as previously mentioned, for the 1920 uh, fiscal year, we received an increase of 7.1% to our health and welfare uh, contribution. For this coming year, um, we're from our first interim to second interim, at first interim, if you can recall, we had that at 5% because we took the average for the previous years. We recently got a uh, notice from our, our JPA Board of di Directors and CISC that the range would not exceed 4%. So we have adjusted that from 5% down to 35 And as I mentioned, our budget is a living document. So as soon as we get new information, we adjust the budget accordingly. So this is an adjustment that I commend our staff in making sure that we can squeeze dollars where we can. And so we reduced the 5% down to 3.5 for 2021. And we are maintaining the 5% for 2122 unless we get further new information for the out year. Health and welfare at second interim is $58.3 million cost to the district. I'll hand it over to Helen so she can cover our multi-year projections. Okay, um, for our multi-year projections. Um, multi-years are a uh, projection, not a forecast. And so we use different factors that we get through the governor's budget workshop um, to use those. Um, and so looking at our multi-year projections, um, for the unrestricted, we're beginning with 24.94%, um, 24.94 million. Um, we're uh, deficit spending in this year to the tune of 14.33 million. Over the next three years, we will have, currently we'll, we have our 3% reserve in all three years, but in the last year, you'll notice that we only have like 170,000 more than our 3% reserve. The restricted funds are pretty much down to using what they receive in the current year and spending it. We have the contributions to the other um, programs. And overall, um, it shows that we will have our 3% reserve and $170, sorry. Um, so, go ahead. Um, this is just a chart of all this the expenditures, so we have our salaries and benefits, which is the majority, it's about 83, almost 84% of the budget, and um, other expenses are around uh, 16%. For salaries, we have um, the salaries here for 135 million and broken down by um, the different ones. Certificates, at, certificate is at 61%, and um, classified at 28% and the management's about 10%. And then for benefits, as you can see, our health and welfare is about 54%, which is the majority of um, the different benefits and STRS and PERS follow that. Um, here are our contributions um, and I'll quickly, we've gone over this before. So as you can see, special ed and routine restricted maintenance are our biggest um, contributions there in the amount of 30 uh, million and 8 million. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Joe. Here. So in regards to the uh, unrestricted restricted um, for the contributions, uh, the state and federal government has funding that has strings attached and we can only spend it a certain way. That is restricted funding. For un, uh, unrestricted, those are funds that are uh, have less strings attached and can be used f uh, at, within the local control and are flexible, but because of the lack of state funding, this is where we have our flexible dollars being used and transferred to restricted programs. So our budget assumptions, uh, as I mentioned, the declining enrollment, the ADA uh, 
0.5% increase annually, and that's contributed to our Saturday Academies and our uh, all-in everyday attendance campaign. We must right-size as a district our staffing to declining enrollment throughout our, our district. We also have reduced uh, district office and legal services, an additional 70,000 from the previous first interim. Maximize our LCAP funding. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a positive certification. Uh, one footnote is the second interim does not include uh, nor are um, actuals or multi-year include any ongoing negotiations. So whether it's a 1%, 2%, or 3%, that is not included in our budget documents. They're still ongoing. Cost-saving measures taken to date. We have right, uh, continued to right-size uh, the district. Uh, we went from coordinators from 16 to 8, and those coordinators now sh um, shared uh, dual sites, a savings of 610000 We've also right-sized our district office management and staff, a savings of 670000 and we're continuing to do more analysis there. District services, we reduced our legal services in a, 150000 in addition to what we previously reduced. And we are reduced contracted services, 250000 and then a reduction of transportation uh, taxi services of 180000 The 180000 reduction to transportation was to the implementing internal efficiencies and maintaining our white fleet internally and developing uh, that white fleet so that we can hire our own people to drive our own students to, site, to sites where previously we had taxis. We're still working on building that up. Another, I'd like to commend our HR department and our business services staff in position control is continue to make sure that we monitor our budget and our staffing and making sure that budgets and funding sources are aligned and making sure that the systems have the right staffing at the right places. We need to, and we are in the process of establishing a five-year deferred maintenance plan so that we make sure we have the infrastructure um, over a five-year term that we have a plan set aside to fund those projects, and that is plumbing, gas lines, HVAC, et cetera. And one of the other areas where we're looking at, and we have found um, some findings, is reducing overtime, comp time, and uh, looking into employee absenteeism and student absenteeism. The continue our fiscal efficiency roadmap is we need to continue a meeting with sites and departments, review our budgets, the key stress point is to stay within budget and whatever, um, make the adjustments accordingly if we're not spending our budgets. Enhance internal efficiencies of our enrollment, our average daily attendance, our district office services, making sure we're efficient as we can. Moving forward, as our staff mentioned, we had to use the additional 3%. So we only have the, a minimum 3% state mandated requirement for our reserve we no longer have the, res the board resolution 3% on top of that. So we had to use the 6% and now we're down to 3%. The goal is to try to rebuild that, but it's gonna be very difficult with the declining enrollment. Um, stop deficit spending, and we need to reduce our special ed uh, contribution. And I'd like to commend Casey and Heather and SELPA department. They have taken huge strides in doing that, and we're continuing to do that work. Um, this evening, we also have, uh, and it's a concern of mine, is making sure that we pass our board resolutions for cash flow. We currently have the ability to enter fund borrow when we're short on cash. We will be short on cash towards the end of, of this year, and that's something that we need to prepare for, and that's why those resolutions are on the board. We have two, a couple options is go to the county, but then also enter fund borrow from ourselves. And so we currently have our bond program where we're able to do that, um, but I just want to be precautionary and conservative and make sure that we have other resources in place. And that concludes my report, and our staff recommendation is to please approve the second interim report with the positive.
to tell her about the, uh, the importance of voting for these budgets because of staff, her. <laughs> she wouldn't get paid either. Um, staff to get paid. So, you know, so, you know, pe <laughs> you really have to understand where we're coming from and understand, you know, um, where we have to go and, and why we have to do these things <laughs> as well. Thank you. Um, and it, it was great to hear about, I'd like even to get a copy of that, the ways that you've reduced funding, um, all the, this page that you showed me to do that. I'd love to get a copy of that, just so I can have that available to know that that's happened. That would be great. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Trustee Hall. On slide 20 under fiscal recovery plan where we talk about reestablishing the um, additional 3%, how are we expecting to reestablish that? So if, um, one of the items that we look at is on slide uh, 13. As you see, 1920, the, the deficit spending. In the out year, we've reduced the deficit spending, and it's really internal efficiencies and then increasing our average daily attendance and reducing our contributions from unrestricted to restricted programs. So it's a combination of all those items to do that. Um, we are going to have some hard work to do that, but those are um, a recommendation so we can become fisc or maintain fiscal solvency in the out years. And also looking through cafeteria special revenue funds, like how deeply are we likely to be affected by changes in federal guideline and funding for these programs? So that would, uh, from the federal, um, we are directly impacted by the federal um, guidelines and or uh, revenue and funding measures. One of the items is the free and reduced and poverty income guidelines. The federal government has not determined that for this coming year, uh, but we have, we'll see that in the next couple months. That is a direct impact to our families and our community who qualify or can qualify for free and reduced lunch. They're also implementing some food nutrition uh, regulations that we have to follow as they are implemented. So there, there is a direct impact to our district in regards to the federal program. And I just wanted to, you know, because I also you know, received many emails about voting no. And just as a statement, it's like looking at, for, for me, like this is, my vote is about whether or not I think these numbers are accurate. And even at a minimum, if, you know, talking to, you know, other, you know, other sources, you know, for what the impact, like the very minimal impact would be the County Office of Education rerunning all these numbers with likely the exact same result, you know, at the cost to the district. And so, you know, where I'm weighing is, you know, ethical principles of beneficence doing good versus non-malfeasance, which is doing no harm. And to me, the idea of having the County Office of Education rerunning the exact same numbers, getting the exact same results, doesn't have a strong enough of a balance of beneficence to outweigh the non-malfeasance of doing no harm. I'd like to point out our first interim was reviewed by the county and approved by the county. Our second interim conversations in the budget development process is in partnership with the county, and they do question um, our various accounts, our debits and credits, et cetera. And so it's, um, and then once, if it's board approved, it's submitted to the county for further review. Still reviewed. <laughs> Anybody else? Trustee Shocker. So, you know, I have traditionally in the past few votes have voted no for the budget and my feeling of why I've voted no is I think that we need to do more to streamline our budget especially looking at the road ahead with declining enrollment um, with government funding up in the air with uh, presidential presidential election coming up where we don't know what's going to happen and potential cuts in federal funding as well as uncertainty with state funding what other things beside these few listed have we been looking at to move forward to reducing our budget? So we are looking at all contracted services. We are looking at all um, even IT um, 
uh, license and software where there could be duplication or a lack of alignment to our core uh, curriculum. So we're reviewing those items. We're also looking at all services, both contracted and or uh, internal services to become more efficient. We, and an other piece is we're focused on the unrestricted side of the budget because that is where we can make the most um, uh, impact and addressing the unrestricted side of the, uh, the budget, but making sure that we continue to be efficient and looking at our contribution factors. So SELPA and transportation are, are two main factors there. And then the smaller contributions that we have from the general front, general fund on the unrestricted side. And there's some school sites there. So we're also looking at how we can um, be more efficient there. There are a balance to making sure that we keep reductions as far away from the classroom. And so we're looking at overtime, comp time, and but making sure it doesn't have an impact to the cleanliness of our sites and or operations. So it's a balance. Um, and there are other numerous factors that we're working on. Um, that we can update the board. Um, I want to make a, a point though, and the adopted annual budget, the difference between that, that is where we make a, uh, a position as a district how we're going to fund certain initiatives or how we're going to fund certain programs. That's where we take uh, a stance uh, as a district which direction we're going in the out years in the fiscal year. A first interim and second interim is you know what you're um, in your checking account and it's just managing your debits and credits and it's a report of what came in your checking account and what was paid out of your checking account. That's all the first interim and second interim in layman's terms. To summarize that, that's what it is. And the adopted budget last year, it's working off last year's adopted budget. And so, you're welcome. So I have a comment to make. Yeah. Um, so all of our 3,500 employees, I think that's how many we have, correct? Um, rely on their salary to support themselves and their families. So I will be voting yes tonight uh, for that reason with the condition that between now and May, we work diligently to identify cost saving measures in collaboration with PBFT, CSEA, even meeting with Emily to uh, you know, look at our numbers. Why are your numbers different than ours? In an effort to uh, be able to offer the best total compensation package possible without contingency language. I would also like to request staff, and I, I've shared this email with Michelle and Joe, uh, to look into or explore the following as cost saving measures, um, trustee benefits and stipends, furloughs for administration attendance. For students who we know will be absent before or after the winter break, could they make up their absences through independent studies whether, while they're out? Um, is a budget allocation for books and supplies restricted? Is there a way to save there? Are all elementary schools now down to two administrators? If not, is this an option? I know that for some elementary schools we have a principal and then two assistant principals. We don't have that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we don't have that at the middle or even the high school level. Um, or we, or do we? Do we have two vice principals yeah, so, and a principal? Um, currently, there's a principal and assist uh, academic coordinator, and then now there's just a part time, or for next year, there will just be a part time um, extended learning coordinator. Currently, there are three, and next year everybody will have 2.5. And that resulted from, partly from the boat that we did, did this last past, past time. time. Thank mm -hmm. you for doing that. Um, and then also, again, can individual departments analyze their budgets, right? Transportation, food services, adult ed, special ed. I know special ed has done pretty good in, in finding some cost saving measures there. Going line by line, zero based budgeting, right? Applying all of what we've done with the district budget at the department level. Um, are there any program, uh, pro programs, academic or not, currently in place are not effective? Um, and or cost effective that we can cut. Uh, looking into consolid consolidating bus routes even further. I don't know, we rely on fuel purchasing practices. Are we getting the best deal out there? Um, 
Are there any additional energy conservation measures we can implement, aside from what we ha already have? Um, possibly looking into the possibility of increasing fees that are associated with uh, our facilities use. Any way to limit or eliminate over time for our hourly employees? <clears throat> Review water usage, such as sprinklers, toilets, et cetera. Any way we can recycle water? Um, and then <laughs> to the extent of eliminating food dinner for school board meetings. Um, and then my last one will be uh, looking into the possibility of implementing a district-run preschool option for employees at a reduced cost, yet making it so that additional revenue um, is generated through this option. And I think, I mean, the list can go on, but these are just a couple of ideas um, that we can look into because it's, it is a by-prioritizing, and we want to make sure that we stay away from the classroom as much as we can. Thank you. So, Board Member Orozco, we are looking at uh, your ideas and suggestions, and then our fiscal team, and I know our superintendent is dedicated to fiscal transparency, so we'll work on setting up a meeting with union leadership so that our the books are open and the doors open, so we'll make sure to continue to do that. And um, what we do to once board approved, we do provide a hard copy and electronic copy to union leadership, and we'll also set up a meeting with them. Thank you, Joe. Welcome. Any more comment or question? Trustee DeSerpa. Hi. Um, I just, in going through all the slides, I just had written down some questions. So this is in no real particular order, but um, one of the questions I had was about a slide that said something about establishing a five-year maintenance plan. Can, I was wondering if you could say more about that, Joe. So currently, one of our internal weaknesses as a district is we do not have a deferred maintenance plan. So we are structured in a sense where it's a, a sense of urgency or as an item breaks, we rush to fix it. And sometimes we don't have the internal resources or the time to do so. And I will take uh, Watsonville High School as an example and or Cesar Chavez Middle School. A deferred maintenance plan takes an inventory of our infrastructure and I'll use gas line and plumbing as an example. How old are those systems? And what is the lifespan of those systems? And so should we replace those every 20 years, 30 years, et cetera? And it puts a plan together to uh, make sure what is a priority, what is needs to be replaced within a one year down or down the road to a five year. And one of those items that's really something we need to look at is our HVAC units uh, throughout the district but that's what's currently going on right now. The board supported a facilities master plan, and so we have Maddie Architects uh, that'll be visiting all our school sites throughout the district and doing an inventory of our infrastructure. And so that is ongoing as we speak. So do we still have a deferred maintenance um, endowment through the bond? Yes, we do. And are we using that? I'm guessing it's coming to its end point because it's, it was only good for 10 years. That was my understanding. Correct. And we are using the funding uh, every or every fiscal year. We are maximizing that funding and putting it to good use. And so were we only using that fund for like stopgap measures for crises or we were, were we actually using it for it was planful? Uh, like because we were going to up to replace a lot of the HVAC systems across the district. A combination of both. Okay. Um. I think you answered the one about reestablishing the ending fund balance. So the enrollment loss that's projected is just the consultant who took a look, who we hired to take a look at declining enrollment? Yes, yeah, so it was a consultant firm with, that included um, census data, live birth rate within our community, um, housing development, um, and then also met with internal staff. And so it was a combination of the uh, demographer and uh, internal staff. And then we did our research to make sure that uh, looking at the variance with the firm, and it was approximately 1% um, over the last five years. Okay. And when you talk about right size staffing, does that mean not like allowing attrition to just sort of have staff like 
retire or leave the district and then not replacing those positions because of the declining enrollment? Correct. So okay. based on resignations, retirement, and if there's a loss at elementary, middle, and high school, just making sure that our staffing aligns to the loss of enrollment. And have we and considered like a golden handshake? We did that in my first couple of years on the board where we offered a special package to senior staff who were ready to retire. That's one item we can uh, add to the list. However, in the past, the savings did not come to fruition uh, because the uh, positions were backfilled. And so it just depends, but we can take another look at that. But they're high earners, so, you know, so getting the high earners off the books sometimes uh, I think does actually save money. We can review that. Um, but anyway, maybe we can just kind of look into that. Um, anyway, thank you very much for all the hard work behind this, and um, I'll be supporting uh, the second interim tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Trustee Acosta. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Um, so we've really um, been consistently hearing um, from the district admin team about the issue with the declining enrollment and how that is affecting the budget, right? Yes. So um, I'm just curious that if we have a declining enrollment, it makes an obvious question to start questioning the number of people that we employ. And I'm not necessarily speaking at the staff and the faculty level, I'm speaking more at an admin level. So what have we done as a district admin and as a governing board to actively look at the number of cabinet members we have and those contracts and the number of directors we have, not principals, not vice principals, at the number of directors we have and those contracts in so correlation to our di declining enrollment, but we will be as well as just to look at them, period. So we are analyzing all positions in the district to right size to enrollment, and that includes district office staff, district administration, and district site staff. Can you so go back to that last slide about, oh, it's right there. Okay. So you say management. So when you're saying management, you're specifically speaking to directors, I take it. Yes, all management. Including cabinet. We're reviewing all the positions. This, the ones included in this, these are directors and or coordinators, and those are also being reviewed in the analysis. So not cabinet. Cabinet will be also be reviewed as, as we move forward. As well as those contracts? Yes. Okay, so all cabinet, the number of cabinet members, those contracts, the number of directors, and those contracts, as well as coordinators and the additional staff, will be looked at. And that's part of right-sizing our district as a whole. So as once, um, as a district, we were looking at similar size districts. Once we were at 18,341, uh, so how compared to another district, how is that staffed? And so now that we're on a trend to go to 16,593, and probably in the out year, probably less, Mm -hmm. That's something we need to look at as, uh, from a holistic approach. Okay. And yeah, I just wanted to also clarify on this projected declining enrollment that I'm reading this correctly. I understand that the yellow bar graph is for ADA and the enrollment is green. So the enrollment is actually over the projected ADA? Correct. Okay. Because our average daily attendance, it's not 100% of the kiddos attending school every day. The average daily attendance is, we hope, and we're projecting 97%. And But those are the numbers. So for 18, 19, it was 95.86, 1920, 96%, 2021, 96.50, and 21, projected to be the 97. For 19, I'm sorry, 2021 projected to be 96.50, and 21, 22 projected to be 97, correct? So 18, 19, 95.8 was actual. Actual. That, that was the actual. 1920, we're projecting 96%. We got some work to do there. And we're got trying it. to do that with the Saturday Academies and the Attendance Initiative. 2021, we're projecting a, a half percent increase and then another half percent. That's what I saw. You, you're getting about a half percent increase on that. Um, so on top of 
that um, comment I made about wanting to make sure that there is a close look taken at all number of cabinet members, those contracts, number of directors, those contracts, as well as coordinators and those contracts. Um, the other thing that I have also said in the past that I'll, I will reiterate here is to for when we talk about health and welfare benefits, right, and not just to the district, it's to any employer. One of the, the lar two largest expenses any employer holds is payroll and health and welfare. So in looking at health and welfare, there are many things that can be done creatively to reduce those costs without attacking the benefits of employees. So what other things are we doing creatively to, as a district, as the admin, as this governing body to creatively look at how we can reduce those costs and possibly incentivize employees that don't necessarily maybe need, maybe want to be with PAMP and can maybe go with an HMO and have a lower cost? What are we actually actively doing to look at that and what we can do to incentivize those employees? So that's another one. Um, and then, again, a curiosity about the budget, the line by line. On all, have we looked at all spending categories as by percentage? Because numbers, as you and I both know, at the end of the day, don't mean things. Looking at the percentages and the change in percentages, that's what really matters, right? Um, with other truly comparable districts, right? And to say, for us just to compare against districts in this county isn't truly comparable when we are really the largest district. I mean, one of the largest districts out of 1,100 in the state of California. So what are we doing to actually look at that line by line <coughs> by percentage comparison? And if so you could bring, we could have that data brought back. I think that is essential. So this evening in your uh, packet, you have the variance report. So that is the, the next step or uh, the part of the fiscal team is to review that percentage difference from a adopted to actuals, mm -hmm. and so that is the work that is going on right now, and we'll provide an update uh, to the board. I'd also like to commend the board as a whole for supporting staff and the Health Benefits Committee. So we took major strides in our Health Benefits Committee in partnership with union leadership and the members of that committee to look at options that we implemented, some were implemented last year in negotiations, and we are looking at other options to minimize where we can have cost saving options, but also minimize the impact to our employees. And one of them you mentioned about network. So what would it look yes. like if we adjusted our network, um, still maintain uh, health benefit um, benefits, but just change the network. And that network adjustment would be a savings to the district and we're working on that now. As long as that network adjustment is not, again, it comes back to what I said previously, to not attack employees, because we have several employees. Let's, for instance, Palo Alto Medical Foundation is one of the biggest service providers in this county. I, we have several employees that are already established with care there, right, with right. designated doctors. I don't think it would be pa fair to rip PAMP from those employees. In other words, to me, that's attacking those benefits. So I'm talking about other creative ways to incentivize, not to attack benefits. And, and I appreciate your answer, but I, I don't think you for sure said to me that what I'm asking for is a line by line we'll comparison by percentage, not hard line numbers, to other districts of comparable size, of compar true comparison to this district, okay? We will work on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So now we will just, can I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to support the second interim budget. Is there a second? Move approval. Okay. Uh, President, I'll, Trustee George Jr., I'm going to call for a roll call vote on this vote. Okay. Can I, do, I will now ask for a roll call vote. Aye. No.
Trustee Shocker, your vote? No. Trustee Osmondson, your vote? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Trustee Holm, your vote? Aye. Trustee DeSerpa? Aye. Trustee Acosta? No. Trustee Orozco? Aye. President Dodge? No. Okay. Four. Passes with a vote of 4-3. Four, four All right, thank you very much. Next, agenda item 8.2, approvals of statistics adoption recommendation and report will be presented by Lisa. We get it. Do we have a... So as we're, we're, we're waiting, I'll just go ahead and start, if that's okay. All right. uh, so good evening, President Dodge, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm here on behalf of our fabulous math coordinator, Otiseli Mendez, is, who is currently on leave, on baby bonding leave. Um, and so I'm here to present the majority of the work that she did with our amazing uh, teachers in PBUSD. In alignment with our other textbook adoptions, the time model for instructional materials evaluation was used for, this, for the statistics pilot process. And it started last May 2019, where we had a team of teachers that came together to review textbook materials, and it um, finished this December, where our pilot teachers actually reviewed after they came through and they piloted the, the materials and decided which one that they liked best. Oh, sorry. And so, see if we can. Um, and so we'll go. So the first, there were three different um, textbooks in, in May that the, a group of teachers analyzed and looked. There was a rubric that they used to go through and uh, look to see which ones. There were two textbooks that were chosen and if you look here, here's a rubric that came through. They went through, and it was the Cengage and the BFW were the two textbooks that were chosen to pilot. After that, pilot teachers were, um, we've, we uh, got pilot teachers from all three of our comprehensive high schools who piloted the materials, the, st the statistics textbook materials, for six weeks each. Um, and then we'd come together, and there would be different meetings where they'd talk about things that are needed and how it, the pilot was going. The student voice was also um, looked at, and so 130, we had 130 responses for students in regards to the two textbooks that were chosen to pilot with uh, the three questions, how accessible did you find the textbook to be, what was the format of the textbook, easy to follow, and how could the textbook be improved, one being the not so good, four being the high end of really liking it. Um, from the student voice, BFW was the textbook of choice. For number three, I just put one quote. If we used it all year long instead of switching to the second book because the second book is not very understandable, the book is definitely good because it gives clear examples and is very easy to read and understand. All three teachers were in agreement with the student voice, and with that, the recommendation, the PBUSD Statistics Pilot Committee recommends by unanimous decision that the school board approves statistics with probability and applications as the core curriculum for statistics. Also included in the packet is the quote, which is for a six year timeline that we have with the company. Any public speakers? No. Any discussion from the board? Yes. Trustee Shocker. Do we not have a current statistics program? 
the current statistics program is very outdated. How outdated? That I don't know the exact year. I'm guessing 10 years. Well, that would help to know that answer to that question. Thank you. Any other questions? The Nan, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so this will be offered at all three comprehensive or more than that? All three and also um, with a possibility at Renaissance. Oh, great. Um, and we have current teachers at all three of those schools teaching this now? Yes, all three from the comprehensive high schools piloted. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion from the board? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion? I, I, I'm going to give a motion to uh, approve um, the statistics and probability with applications book. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, I will now call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. 5-2. Thank you. Next up, agenda item 8.3, um, Consortium on Reaching Excellence in Education, Core SIPs and Rewards Support 2020-2020 Service Agreement. Report will be sent in, be presented by Casey. Good evening, um, President Dodge, members of the board, and Dr. Rodriguez. I am here. I bring forward um, for your approval the service agreement between PVUSD and the Consortium on Reading on Reaching Excellence in Education. Um, PVUSD has been able to successfully increase literacy results with the use of SIPs and rewards support for students with disabilities. This contract is to continue support of the program in the 2020-2021 school year. Um, the core consultant, Gail Adams, will continue to support the rewards and SIPs reading programs, um, the implementation of special education classrooms in all six of our middle schools. She'll continue to work closely with the district um, rewards and SIPs TOSAs, providing demonstration lessons, supporting our classroom teachers um, by reviewing data, and supporting the instructional assistants also, and our principals in supporting those classrooms. Um, our goal is to continue to increase um, our students with disabilities and make sure that they are increasing levels of actually being able to be on the diploma track by the time that they get into um, high school. We also want to make sure that we are increasing their literacy skills so they also have access to their core um, grade level content standards. Dr. Rodriguez? Yeah, so I just wanted to mention, so the difference between this and what we're doing at the elementary schools is the program in, is the level of program. So currently we have three elementary level programs that we started now three years ago, which we do have trained staff on and we have trained coaches on. This program here is SIPS Plus. So this program has two nuances to it that we do not have currently at the elementary level. So we can't just bring someone from the elementary level to here because it's not the same program. So elementary uses beginning, extension, and challenge. This is SIPS Plus, which is meant for adolescent readers. And, and it's for our special education students and their accommodations. So what this allows us to do is to be able to build that base, so build our capacity and yes, it is funding that we are using, but we spend exorbitant amounts of money on credit recovery and on intervention for students. And our students need to be able to read. And, um, and so we're in the middle of, looking, of working on the data right now for um, the elementary version. Um, the secondary version, we just started it. Um, and so this would allow us to do that just like we did for elementary. We will keep reducing the consultant agreement. Um, the, and they use two separate um, people. So one uses Ann Leon, which is the elementary. And then um, this one uses Gail Adams, who has um, specialty in adolescent reading and in special education. So I just wanted to show the, um, the differences between the two. Thank you very much. Um, is there a public comment? Do we have public? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any, any discussion from the board? Trustee or Hall? Did someone turn a card in? 
I didn't have one. No, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I just saw someone. Did I miss one? Okay. Um, just, so just, just so I'm understanding, you said we can't pull from elementary for the this this version. So that means that you know, so we absolutely do not have somebody qualified currently in district. Yes, we do not each, and the teachers that have had to transition, even the elementary teachers that have had to transition from um, beginning to extension, will tell you that it is. It's a different routines, different programs. It also with this, a lot of what we're trying to get support on is grouping of students. And so what we have found, especially at the middle school level, and we're gonna implement it this next year, is that the way that the students were rostered really got in the way of us being able to group the students well. Um, but we have had really great results um, from feedback from Anne Leon. I, don't know of really many people out there that don't. We actually are having the opposite um, feedback at elementary right now of why we're not having additional focus um, similar to this with the bilingual programs. Um, and so it's, um, but most importantly, and most importantly is we're increasing the number of students that can read. And I cannot um, overemphasize the importance of that for every single curricular area, including mathematics, because now mathematics is very um, literature based with all the reading that's required. Anybody else? Any, any other? Uh, Trustee Osmond? Just so I can understand, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so there's been lots of you know, complaints from teachers that we could use teachers to do the training and there's a lot of teachers that are capable of doing it. And, and I understand the special education, that might be different. But um, for example, is there teachers doing training and SIPs in, in some of the elementary and other levels? Yeah, so we, we cut our contract in half over the last year and a half for SIPs. Part of doing that was to have lead teacher leads at each site. So we have at the elementary level, because we've done it now three years, we have, um, for the English classes, we have lead teachers who are training teachers. Okay. Um, and so we've significantly reduced that consultant. But... They, I want to remind everyone, they had the program for years prior to the consultants coming in and saw no growth. Yeah, no, I know that. And yeah. so the, it isn't always true that we don't need someone coming in and coaching us. That is actually not accurate and a reason why, um, I mean, it was not the teacher's fault, it was the administration fault that we implemented a program and didn't provide the support. Yeah. Um, but um, they were not trained on it before. And our coaches will tell you that they did not know um, how to train on it. All right. So we are doing some of it in the middle school. You can comment if you want to. <laughs> we are trying to do some of the SIPs programming in the middle school uh, with our middle school grants and kind of things. We're, we're trying to do better. We're using SIPs there too, right? Well, that's exactly what this is. So this is for the second year at the middle school. But, oh, but it's special ed, though. This is special ed. This is special ed and middle school. So this is not elementary. This is oh. not supporting anyone at elementary level. Okay. This is supporting at middle school, okay. which is why there's this thought, oh, we can just bring these people over. It's not the same program. Okay, So absolutely. SIPS Plus is not an elementary program. It's okay. a middle school program, and it's being used in the special education setting. Okay, but we're also using SIPS not in the special education level. We are using SIPS at the middle school, regular middle school as well, right? Not at this point. We're focusing on special education. Okay. Which not, not when we yet. did the assessments, a, an average um, reader of special education at the middle school level is reading a second grade level. Okay. Which right. is a problem. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And as we focus on our work in the elementary with our general education and special education students, they will not need as much support by the time they reach middle school. Right, right. They're, they're coming up from elementary, and now they're going to go. They're going to be up there in SIPs, so they're going to be reading at a higher level when they get there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
That's true. I will comment, Danny. <clears throat> Trustee Wilson. So um, at last year's Michelle's evaluation, one of the directions, the director from the board was to uh, give more of an emphasis to our uh, special ed population. And I think this supports that goal of making sure that we're reaching all students regardless of whether they have a disability or not. Um, so with that, um, I am going to make a motion to move this item forward. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes 4-3. Thank you very much. Um, agenda yeah. item 8.3. I mean, no, sorry. 8.4, school site wireless network upgrades. Report will be presented by Joe Dominguez. All right, this item uh, in front of you provides our um, membership to our JPA, also known as SPUR. And so this is a, a, an opportunity for internal efficiency and pricing. So as a member district, we get a reduction in pricing, uh, competitive pricing throughout the nation. And this is for our E-rate program uh, through the federal government. And so this supports our schools and libraries program throughout the district, the conduit or pipeline for communications, for telecommunication services, but and or as well internet. So funding is provided in two priority categories, uh, category one, telecommunication services, data line services, and category two is internet access, internal connections, and the infrastructure, so cabling and connections. So the federal government allows us to receive 85 cents on the dollar um, for our funding. And then the additional um, necessary funding is, will be from the IT endowment through our bond program. And so we are able and have been awarded to uh, support 36 of our sites throughout our district with the latest high-speed wireless network infrastructure and ensure coverage for every school facility. And with that being said, I'd like to recommend for approval so that we can obtain our E-rate funding and implement uh, upgrades to our wireless infrastructure. Any public speakers to this? Any discussion from the board? Okay. Um, can I? Uh, yeah. Is there any, no speakers? No. So over the 11 years that I've been on the board, we've done many of these E-rate um, resolutions to... Uh, make our money um, go further and to support areas of our district that wouldn't otherwise have any con connectivity at all. And so I remember starting from just dial up to moving to sort of a network, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just for a historical perspective, this is, um, it's an excellent idea and um, I appreciate you bringing it forward. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. I just want to say thank you because this is one of the budget cost saving measures we're looking for. So I would like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. So, with that, can I have a, or, I will not call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Next up, agenda item 8.5 second reading board policy and administrative regulation 5142.2 Safe Routes to School Program. But Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah. So this is just a second reading of our new board policy. So this was off of the presentation that we did around safe schools. So it supports that work um, in terms of the safe schools um, and really encourages us to um, promote the joy of walking, biking, and any other um, active transport to school. It also does address um, such things as working in collaboration with the city, with the state organizations in order to try to get the grants that we need in order to um, be able to put forth the recommendations from the safe school. And so I put it forth for your approval. Any public speakers to this item? No. Any discussion? Yes. Question. So I just want to um, thank everyone for working hard on this. And M Michelle, I'd like to make a, a point because um, we've been able to already start this at PVUSD with one of the grants that our beautiful grant writer has obtained with the Lagasse Kitchen, correct? And Starlight is going to be able to um, start improving their parking lot. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully we'll get the city to improve the parking on Pennsylvania for them too. So then they'll be good. <laughs> 
think and you want to make a motion. Any, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that. Okay. Um, I will now call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion passes 7-0. So next agenda item nine, consent agenda. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with deferring items 9.1, 9.5, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.100, 9.101, 9.102, 9.103, 9.104, 9.105, 9.106, 9.107, 9.108, 9.109, 9.110, 9.111, 9.112, 9.113, 9.114, 9.115, 9.116, 9.117, 9.118, 9.119, 9.120, 9.121, 9.122, 9.123, 9.124, 9.125, 9.126, 9.127, 9.128, 9.129, 9.130, 9.131, 9.132, 9.133, 9.134, 9.135, 9.136, 9.137, 9.138, 9.139, 9.140, 9.141, 9.142, 9.143, 9.144, 9.145, 9.146, 9.147, 9.148, 9.149, 9.150, 9.151, 9.152, 9.153, 9.154, 9.155, 9.156, 9.157, 9.158, 9.159, 9.160, 9.171, 9.172, 9.173, 9.174, 9.175, 9.176, 9.177, 9.178, 9.178, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 9.179, 
clarification on we have just general consult, professional consult, just kind of getting idea. We've got a lot of little small numbers with all these consults. Is that are these for ongoing projects? Are these um, you know for change orders? What is going on with all of these? Yeah, they vary. Uh, some of them, or the some of them are the general contractors or consultants assigned to projects. Um, those range from anywhere, and I will get you a more detailed uh, report to explain each one. But in summary, some include architects, uh, other specialists that are assigned to a project. Um, I'm looking at the list here. There's others that are district uh, consultants, um, and I will get you a, a report on what specific uh, program they're consulting on or what department, but those also vary. And I see one amount of $520 um, up to a range of, um, I think they vary, but we can get right. you a They're a all just small little ones. So that's what, that's what piqued my um, interest and caught my attention as I was just wondering um, for some clarification on that. So I would appreciate that help from you. And if nobody else has any questions, I will move to approve 9.1. I'll second that. Trustee Nisirpa, you wanted to make a comment? No, I, I do. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, right. if we could just maybe in the future um, have that information already added as part of the report, right? When there's, uh, you know, especially anything that has to do with consultants or additional expenses for things that we generally wouldn't see, I think it will be helpful to know what those projects are or what those architects and projects are assigned to and so forth, just so that we have <coughs> access to that information ahead of time. Shocker made the motion and I second it. Okay, so kind of going to vote to approve agenda item 9.1. Approve. Oh. Aye. 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 Anybody oppose? Motion passes. Agenda Aye. item 9.5, which is West Ed co teaching. Vacation, it was the six. Um, yeah, oh. just making sure that we have the sorry. correct vote. Six there zero was one, one absence. One, yes. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Six zero one. Thank you very much. The agenda item 9.5. No, go ahead. So um, can you explain, this was brought up too in public comment, can you explain a little bit about um, 9.5 and um, why we're bringing this um, forward at this meeting and what exactly is going on with it? So this is actually our continued work with um, providing inclusive practices. As you heard at the um, special board study session on special education, that it is, we are not hitting our mark with making sure that the percentage of students that should be in the least restrictive environment are. So this continues the work that we're doing with SIPs and we're starting with the middle school special education students. It's the co-teaching piece in high school, which we're continuing. We've had them working with um, the co-teaching piece in high school, and it's continuing on, and this ensures that we have our students with disabilities having access to the core curriculum and actually staying in the least restrictive environment um, for, their, for their classes, and it also helps them stay on track for um, receiving a diploma or college and career readiness. Okay, my, we, this is basically inflated at Watsonville High School, correct? Mm -hmm. Is where this yep. um, program has been because that's where I've gotten most of my emails from. Um, my concern is um, what's going on with the teachers that are already piloting this program? Are they not able to continue on with this without the consultant? There's been a lot of um, back and forth with them about having a consultant for this. So this is actually providing um, professional development days outside of just the regular classroom instruction support. And it is, they do need the, the continued support with this effort. It's not, it's kind of like the SIPS piece where they need the, the continued support so they're able to do it. It's also providing them the different structures because there are different models for co-teaching and, um, and use universal design for learning also specific strategies to help them in the classroom. Thank you for clarification. Casey, can I ask you a question? So you're saying this is a continuation of something that is already existing, right? And I'm seeing that, I guess, by the 1920 AY, right? 
Yes, it's it's continued work, and it's uh, from a previous AY or from just this one, from a previous academic year or just this one. From this one. Okay, so why is it needing to be brought forward tonight if it's just a continuum? Is the contract up? No, and that and that is why it was under consent, right? So it was under this year, and we're continuing for next year with that for same for, for the AY. 2021. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the clarification on no that. No problem. Thank you. Any questions? Is there a motion to support agenda item 9.5? I'll make a motion to support 9.5. Is there a second? Second. All, right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Agenda aye. item 9.9. Request for allowance of attendance due to emergency conditions, October 10th and 28th, 2019. Six schools closed due to pg and power safety shutoff. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, would you just be able to clarify this? Because I know we get a lot of questions about ADA, so I think this would help just for public record, um, a clarification of what this is for. Sure. So um, during the winter season, um, due to the past fires throughout the state of California, PG&E decided to do um, closure or stoppage of um, electricity for our schools. We do have several schools, um, these six in which they're referring to that run on um, septic tank. And so we cannot um, have those schools function without electricity because they have no toilets. So if, because the septic tanks are run off of electricity, um, and then we had to close them. So what this allows us to do is um, have there be no effect to the ADA. So in essence, thinking of mathematically, it changes the denominator. So normally we have 180 days. Um, they missed um, several days of school, three, I believe it is, right? Um, they, they missed those days or maybe it was, yeah, three, um, one, two, just two, sorry. Um, so soon I forget. Um, so they missed two days. So they would instead have a denominator of 178 days, um, that their students, um, went to school instead of 180. And it allows us not to have to make them up, but not have an ADA loss as well. Thank you for that explanation. With that, I move to approve. I'll second. All in favor of passing 9.9, .9, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. Next up, agenda item 9.10, resolution 1920-31, temporary borrowing between district funds in order to meet the cash flow needs of the district for fiscal year 2020-21. So this item covers, uh, provides the ability for PVSD to borrow uh, with amongst ourselves in interfund borrowing specifically uh, within our bond program. Um, this has previously uh, had similar resolution in previous years as a district, um, and it's a precautionary measure just to make sure that we have the ability to do so if needed. Um, and as I mentioned in the second interim uh, presentation, this is something that we are preparing for um, as we may need to take advantage of the resolution and or interfund borrow in November. Um, and this is this resolution allows us to borrow from ourselves and a period of time to replenish those funds that we borrowed once we receive the so it's a timing issue once we receive the funding then we reestablish the fund that we borrowed it from so Joe in your budget report um, on your fiscal efficiency roadmap um, on your three large bullet points under your fiscal recovery plan, you had a note in there about to reestablish the additional 3% reserve board resolution from a previous governing board. So why do we see that there when we're at a point of needing to borrow funds to potentially protect ourselves? I mean,
I hope I explained that best I can. You did. Thank you for the clarification. Well, Trustee Holt. So just to clarify, when you say it's a precautionary measure, we're not expecting to have to do this, but it's just in case, or are we expecting to have to do this? We may uh, need to borrow. It's a precautionary measure to have that option available to the district. Previous years, we've had this provide, uh, presented to the board and approved. This will probably be the first time we may have to use interfund borrowing. So, Trustee Deserpa. Okay. So, just being um, a new board member and clarifying this, what happens if we can't pay this back? So we have our allocations and cash flow, but the main piece. So to answer your question, then that leads to fiscal insolvency. But we have the um, allocation and the allotment schedule that we can replenish the fund back. So it's more of a timing issue that we don't have cash on hand. Right now we do. This gives us, and some districts don't have the ability to borrow amongst themselves because some districts don't have a bond program. Whereas we have a bond program so we can borrow the necessary uh, amount of cash to meet payroll and to meet our expenditures. Once we get our allotment from the state, then we replenish that fund back. And so we have the ability to do so, and that's what lines us out. It's approximately um, ranges, um, it's, it's different for each district, but approximately a one to three month transaction. Um, and it's about timing, so. Trusting to Serpa. So in the past, um, we have always, seems like every year passed a resolution that if we needed to borrow money, we would borrow it from the County Office of Education. So that's the second portion on the agenda. So, right. Right. So, so, but, so we're talking about actually potentially borrowing money from ourselves via Measure L? Correct. I don't think that's a good idea in terms of the voters. I don't think the voters would like that. That money is really earmarked for... Yeah, and it's only temporary. We've never done that. I don't think we've ever passed a resolution to borrow interbond or whatever you're calling it. Yes, we've passed a resolution in the past to interfund. So we the have. resolution has been passed I thought it previously. was inner funds, but I didn't realize it was inner fund using the bond. Yes, bond is one of them. There's uh -oh. another one like nutrition services, but there's more restrictions because of the federal funding. Um, and there's others, but the bond program has the most flexibility. And it is a, uh, a practice in other K-12 districts that have a bond program they have the ability to do so. But we're getting close to expending the entire contents of the bond. Correct. So there's so. not much left to borrow there, and, and it's earmarked for PB high, so. And we're only gonna need the borrowing for no more than three months, and we put the money back. And it really comes back to the tax um, um, funding and how we get those installments from the state. And so right now we have those two installments twice a year. And so it's just a timing issue. So once we get that revenue, we put the money back into our bond program. So, so it doesn't jeopardize our bond. Does it cost any money to borrow from the county office? There is a slight of uh, interest on that. Um, it's a reduced uh, interest or fee, um, but that's also the second resolution on the board item tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I just Trustee have a Acosta? question of a point of clarification between what you um, said to me in my question and your comment to Trustee Holm. Um, because the way I had interpreted what you'd said, or, or how it, what I'd heard, was that you were saying that we would be borrowing this and that it would be at a cost of an interest expense. But then I had understood that when you had responded to Trustee Holm, you were saying it's a, a what if, that we may, but we may not. But when you'd answered me and I'd heard that we are going to do it, and we will have an interest expense associated with it. So I'm for the, I'm, for the I mean, maybe I heard wrong. So for the inner fund borrowing for this resolution, we may, and and if there, we do, there will be an interest expense. Well, if it's inner fund borrowing, it's an interest to ourselves. Selves. Okay. So it actually uh, complements our bond program so when we inner fund borrow. So it's not a penalty or um, uh, an ex um, external cost to the district. And at the most, it's approximately about three months timeline 
because of the tax uh, allotments to the district. And so this is um, how that process works. And then we replenish uh, the bond program for the funds that are needed. And right now we are looking at November, but I wanna also stress to the board, a lot of things can change what the governors may revise, that can also uh, change the financial outlook. And maybe there's changes within that where we're not gonna need to interfund borrow. But as of right now, we are projecting November, we may have to interfund borrow. And, and to Trustee DeSerpa and Trustee Shocker's point of concern about where this is coming from, from Measure L, and what if we can't repay it? What does that mean to me that fund from Measure L? So those, those are funds that are already allocated, that we're yeah. borrowing from. You know, it's like Peter borrowing from Paul to pay Mary. I mean, this is like a vicious cycle. So it's a- It's, it's very a, concerning. I'll come back. It's a timing issue, and then there's state ed code on the tax uh, allotments to districts. So by law, those tax um, have to be dispersed throughout the state of California to K-12 districts. Those are on certain timelines or schedules. That schedule doesn't align with where we're at in our cash flow. And so we know that we will receive that tax uh, allotment within that three month period of time. And this so, is for AY 2021. And you're, it sounds like you're pretty certain this is gonna happen. And well, as of right now, I, with the information I have on hand, today, yes. Today, correct. What correct. I have today. I may that. revise, that'll be something else. Right. And then I just want to stress to the board, one of the main factors districts become fiscally insolvent is cash on hand. And so we have the ability right now to cover cash on hand with our bond program until the, talk, the tax allotment is provided and then we can replenish the fund. Um, but I am concerned. Um, and this also is um, a forecast what we have with the given information as of today. Okay. I guess just one comment for me. I'm willing to support tonight with a condition that if we do end up borrowing, that we bring this item back just so that there's transparency, that we're able to see that if we did take funds, that we, we actually did return those, just for the public, just because it's coming strictly from Measure L, um, and we're, we're being held accountable for that money and where that's going, so. Will do. I, and I would like to add on that, that it not be a consent agenda. Oh, no, absolutely not. I, yeah, I think I that, want that, it to that, be that. a discussion item. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Joanne. With that, I would like to move for approval. Second. I'll second okay. that with Maria's recommendation. Okay, so well, I'll take a, a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Next up, agenda item 9.11, resolution 19 2030. President Dodge, can I interrupt? Can I make a motion to extend tonight's meeting to 11 o'clock? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor to extend to 11 o'clock? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Agenda, uh, I'll repeat. Agenda item 9.11, resolutions 19 2030 to the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Cruz to provide temporary cash loans to Pajaro Valley Unified School District. So this item is specific uh, for the, and I appreciate and thank you for the support on the previous item. So if we do not have uh, enough interfund borrowing within internally, then this gives us an option to go to the county for additional borrowing. And so this is a precautionary measure. Um, Right now, we don't foresee that happening, but it also to, allows us as a district to provide that and notify the county. And how it's structured is districts need to, if they have the ability to interfund borrow internally first, that's what districts are asked to do. If they're not allowed to borrow amongst themselves, interfund, then they approach the county. And so this is also a precautionary measure and positions the district so that we can, if needed, borrow uh, on a short-term basis from the county. Is this again for the 2020-21? Yes. And is it the same time period you're talking about? Approximately. And what is that cost of that borrowing? 
It'll depend on well, given scenarios. Right now, we are asking for uh, not to exceed $15 million on this resolution, but that is a what-if scenario. Um, and that depends on the May revise, um, cash flow, et cetera. So, but right now, we were, we're asking up to $15 million if needed. Well, I mean, I get it changes if we borrow $15 million versus $10 million, but the percentage of that rate at what we're charged for borrowing, does that changed by whether it's 15 million or 10 million or is the percentage rate stay the same whether it's 15 million or 10 million so let's say it was four percent is it four percent at 15 million and four percent at 10 million that's something that the county has but it's it's reduced at a lower rate i don't have oh that. so they scale it yes yes they okay, scale so that's it the answer to my question amount. so if it's 10 million it's more it's if a it's a lesser rate. amount it's actually a lesser rate it is yes okay all right, thank you for the clarification. Welcome. Uh, any other comments? Karen? Trust Asmussen, I'm sorry. No. Oh. Okay, is, um, I, I just wanted to quickly say, like, Joe, we're, we're relying on you to get this, you know, this data correctly to us because Measure L is really important to us. You know, the voters in 2012, they, they worked really hard to get the projects and kind of borrowing is kind of, well, for me, it's nerve-wracking, but I believe most of us have faith in what you're doing, and we'll go ahead and go vote. I think a lot of us have faith in Joe. So. Um, the summer projects are on schedule for this coming summer, and then we also have the planned summer projects for the following summer, yeah. so this will not uh, impact yeah. those just, projects. Just, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, is there a motion to support this agenda item? So with that faith in Joe, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Oh. We all second. Okay. <laughs> we all second. <laughs> okay. uh, this, uh, that's Trustee Holmes seconded. So, all all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Um, agenda item eleven, closed session. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on March eleventh, twenty twenty, with twenty seven and eight additional action items. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, action item 12, action report. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's more. Sorry, there's more. Um, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on March 11th, 2020 with 20 action items. Is there a motion? That is a motion, but I'll second her motion. Okay. Rita? Sorry, I second it. I, I second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion passes. Now do the readout. Okay. So during closed session, as per resolution 19-2028, the PVSD Governing Board of Trustees voted 7-0 on the non-reelection of certain probationary certificated employees for the following employees, 8-2-7-0, 8-3-1-7, and during closed session, the PVUSD Governing Board of Trustees voted 3-4 to rescind the non-reelection of probationary certificated employee 8198. Okay. Um, I don't have the date for the next meeting, but I believe it's March 24th here yeah. or, or March, 25th. March 25th and here or? So um, information just came down just about 20 minutes ago that they are making um, flexibility for Brown Act for um, due to the coronavirus um, throughout the state of California. So um, it is possible that we will have more of a virtual um, option this upcoming board meeting, but it, it will be on March 25th. Okay. March 25th. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. It might be virtual.